Welcome back, Flyers Nitty Gritty fans, to Getting Gritty With It with your host, Yuri Wallach, my partner in crime, Vasily Gianna Rocco's. What's up, man, for another episode? How you doing? Uh, doing well. Tomorrow's Friday, end of the end of the week. Been a busy week for me um, on a lot of fronts. You know, got got a lot of stuff going on with work. Uh, my cousin, my first cousin's getting married actually on Saturday, nice. so it's gonna be a big fat Greek wedding. Uh, so that'll be fun. <laughs> but other that than that, great actually. Yeah, other than that, uh, not too much going on. How about you, Yuriev? How have things been? Good, man. Pretty good. Pretty good. Um, you know, same. Doesn't change. Uh, but let's welcome our guest. And it's weird to call him a guest because he is obviously co founder of the site. Excited to have him back on. Obviously, a very dear friend of mine and Vasily's, Jay Vascow. How are you doing, buddy? Yeah. Mahalo. I just want to say aloha to everybody who knows it's been a long time since I've, uh, you know, come on. You know, that's what's, uh, I guess that's what having uh, 100 kids, uh, you know, a wife, you know, uh, <laughs> that's what it all does no i'm joking uh but uh no i'm looking forward to this and uh vasily i can tell you this man uh at least five plates will be broken on saturday at the wedding um minimum i'm planning on breaking a few of my own here and more or less because of the flyers uh they're it's hard to take out frustration so what are you going to do i'm going to knock out a plate so uh you know we throw it over my deck or something like that stuff i like it smash it Couple uh, plate breaks, a couple, ouzo, a couple of ouzo shots, and we're good. Hey. Can't, can't beat them. Break a plate. I like it. Hey, listen, I need I need the recipe for those ouzos. I'll do one with you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to get back to you on that one. <laughs> um. Yeah, Jamie, it's good to have you back on. And uh, for those of you who started listening later and aren't aware, Jamie and I started this site. Well, I don't even know how long ago already. Jamie is like the lifeblood. If you don't, if you don't know about Jamie and you follow Flyers Nitty Gritty, I'd be absolutely flabbergasted. But if you don't follow him on Twitter, you, you need to. He's like ahead of everybody else on pretty much every tweet. So you're behind if you're not following him. Um, Actually, I'm going to tell you who goes pound for pound, man. Vasily. <laughs> that guy, man, I'll tell you, Vasily is something else, man. He stepped up his game, man. He's been a big addition to the site. Let's be <laughs> honest. He's making his way through the site. Dude, I see it, man. Trying to, right. trying to. Podcast with you and everything. It's yeah. great, man. It's yes, great. it is. I'm, I'm happy you found a, a partner. Uh, like, like your reef was saying, we actually started originally getting gritty with it, and then I, I, with I, you I, too, I, exactly. Man, yeah. I, I just, I, I, I was so unpredictable with in terms of timing. It wasn't fair. Like on days, I had to push back days for your reef. It just wasn't fair to him and. You know, uh, you know, uh, you know, I want my kids, you know, I'd rather have, you know, to be honest with you, I'd rather have the kids. <laughs> hey, ain't that the truest statement? I'd, I'd well, rather well, see my children. Then talk about the <laughs> no, Flyers being a no, bad but, team. Well, <laughs> in, 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 in all actuality, those should be aware, like, there's a, re- Jamie writes a ridiculous amount of content. He edits, he manages, like, almost everything that goes to this site, so... Yeah, that it's it's a lot doing the podcast on top of that too. So it's you, you it, it makes sense this way. But I'm gonna be honest, we're we're a team here and everybody puts in their share of the pie. Hell yeah. Exactly. Like you you guys clean up the mess in terms of technology issues, man. You guys handle the YouTubes, uh come out with great articles, you know, as well. Do the podcast, upload. You know, how many times have you said, oh, man, you sat there for like 16 hours trying to get the podcast, you know, re- you know recorded, you know? Yeah, uh, yeah, I've definitely had some technical difficulties and lost sleep. But see, you guys are the tech gurus. And this is why. How many times have I lost my head over some technology? I know, you right? Call you and you're like, what's the problem? <laughs> like, yeah. That's making me feel, Vasily, we're going to talk after this episode. I have some ideas, like, just brewing from Jamie talking, stuff that I used to do that I feel like we should start tackling together. Yeah, yeah so uh, I, I think uh, one thing that I was thinking of are these player profile videos. Yeah, I, that's, that what I, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, I used Speaking to do, but- of player profiles, I actually am going to be doing, like, some articles and going in-depth on, like, potential players perfect that timing. the five pick. So yeah, perfect go. timing. It's gonna be boring as <laughs> shit for a little bit. Though I have a feeling that it's probably about to end and the Flyers are probably gonna announce a coach within the next what couple weeks? Two, couple weeks. I'd assume so. But, but pretty God, the playoffs. one's fired before the draft. Yeah. 
<laughs> I think that'd be would, the best case scenario, but we'll yeah, I'm like I'm I, I'm like in kind of waiter seat mode a little bit more. Um, but let's do it real quick. Let's give a shout out to our sponsor, uh, Jim Steaks on Fourth and uh, South Street. Make sure to get a cheesesteak from Jim's. Um, they're huge Flyers fans. We're Flyers fans. Get a cheesesteak from them. Uh, yeah, no. So let let's talk about flyer stuff, okay? Um. Should we start off with the Connor McClendon news? I feel like we should talk about that because it's kind of like big news of the week. It it's big news, and it's not like I don't think most people are like, "Hey, uh, the Flyers just lost out on a top prospect within the system, and like, you know, what are we going to do without this guy?" It's more of like, and Jamie, me and you were talking on the phone earlier today, and I think this, I think this was like really getting the point. It's like. What more did you want the kid to do? You, you drafted him to be a potential high score. You knew he was undersized. He came in, he put up top of the league points, did everything that was asked to do, and then just doesn't get a contract. You know, it's like he did everything that you want a lower end pick to do and then just kind of let go. And I think on top of that, and um, I do want to talk about Owen McClellan and uh, and talk about Ethan Sampson. And obviously, that's great news. And we'll, we'll get into that. Uh, I like those signings a lot. But, you know, it just kind of feels like a weird direction for the team to go. Um, Jamie, because you haven't been on for a while, I want your take first. And then Vasily, obviously, you know, feel free to chime right back in. It came out with a good article today on this, and Connor McClendon was part of the article, and it was just the icing on the cake. He wasn't the overall uh, landscape of the article or right. landscape of the problems of the Philadelphia Flyers. The problem that most fans and and uh, have a disconnect with the uh, Flyers top brass, and it makes sense, is uh, just like you mentioned, there's no direction. This is actually the first offseason that we're going into to where I'm scratching my head and I have no idea what the heck is going on, uh, Like especially after yesterday. That was the tip of the iceberg there. Uh, like you said, uh, he put, posted 43 goals, uh, point-wise, 81 points in 62 games played. Uh, he was coming off a serious injury in terms of his collarbone, and that's why he fell to the sixth round in the first place. Comes to both camps. He made rookie camp this year, did well. Went to training camp, did well. Like you said, he did everything that he was required to do by the Philadelphia Flyers. They said, try to improve your, skate, your skating. Every 19-year-old has to improve their skating. I think skating is a lackadaisical excuse, uh, you know, to say, hey, if this person can make the next level, which a lot of times that's why a lot of, you know, picks fall, you know, to, to, it makes sense why they fall, but each one should be given a shot. And if that's the case, if the flyer said, Hey, you know, his, his skating progressed, but didn't progress enough. He was never an elite skater to begin with. If he was an elite skater, he would have been, a, you know, a, a first round selection. Uh, you know, those players are notoriously, especially in the creme de la creme of the draft, you know, the first 10 picks. Uh, Connor McLennan probably would have been there with the way he, he he's a natural goal scorer. Uh, the Flyers, my thing is, is that Chuck Fletcher says over and over again that they're in need of goal scorers. And I can't count the, the amount of times I've heard that this year from Chuck Fletcher. And high, every high end Fletcher, talent, right? We're all said, quoting that. Goal scorers. He said they're not scoring enough goals. He, there were there players that he thought would contribute and didn't contribute either a because of injury or b because they were just underachieving you know of some way you know in terms of like you, you, I, I, I i'm lost i'm actually lost and it's not because like I, i'm a massive Connor McClennan fan you know i've seen him a lot i i've 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 interviewed him in november he said that he was in direct contact with philadelphia uh, you know, during when I interviewed him, uh, he's a good kid, has good head on his shoulders. Now, would he have, you know, made an impact at the NHL level? Well, that's remained to be seen. Uh, how many prospects are there, you know, throughout the league? Is each one going to make an impact? We don't know. I think my biggest head scratcher is, is that they, they, they signed Adam Ginnig, who had a troubled, you know, a rocky, I should say, developmental history, but they ELC'd him because, you know, Samuel Morin now is medically retired, so they're trying to replace, you know, Morin and Haig. Well, if they're trying to get a Robert Haig 2.0, why didn't they just keep him? Why'd they trade him to Buffalo then? Uh, because, you know, he was already proven. If you're trying to make Adam Ginning a, a Robert Haig, why did you trade Haig in the first place? There was no point to trade him. 
I mean, he was his salary really wasn't much. What was it, close to two million dollars or something like that? Yeah, just under two million. I mean, come on, seriously. Well, I think a lot of those Adam Ginning, I I just didn't understand it. He's throwing ELCs around like it's hotcakes. You know, and 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 Connor McLennan, who scored the most goals out of every prospect, he, just, in the he, he seemed like a no brainer, huh? He seemed like a no brainer, Mc, McLennan. Yeah, I knew. It, like, I mean, he, was a, he the contractual limit is 50. The Flyers sit at 32 contracts for next season as of right now. There's 18 more. And like you and I discussed earlier, they have a scope of, of how many contracts they want to have. So my point of view is they probably want to sit at 48 contracts with two in limbo just because they, they you know, just for a, a buffer or a cushion, so to speak. Right. So they'll probably get 16, add 16 more contracts somehow to make 48. So with that being said, what's the problem? I mean, you're still going to have to fill the void in the AHL level anyway. Yeah. Don't you want your AHL team? Because if, God forbid, there's injuries like there were last year, almost every single player was hurt in some some way. There were like eight – I counted it. There were like, what was it, ten high-end players, or I say impact players for the Flyers, I should say, not high-end, impact players that were out at the same time last year. So where would what would you do? Now we have to go and pluck either somebody from the Reading Royals. You know, well, you could, also, you could also make the case that there aren't – Many guys on the fans who even have Connor McLennan's skill set. Uh, so I'm with you on Maybe that. Maybe Bobby there's Brink. A lot, there's a lot of them. There's a lot of them on there. You know, like you're going to have Bobby Brink there. You probably have Tyson Forrester start out in the AHL. You know, next season just because they're both Tyson's Brink, coming off. Brink can the make the team out of camp too, though. I mean, it's not like realistically, he probably could, but. I'm saying that because he's coming back from injury, you know, and stuff. Yeah. And playing at the next level is a little bit different than playing, you know, for for the Barry Colts. Not saying I'm, it's no disrespect to Barry, but when you're going from Barry straight to the NHL, it's a pretty big leap, uh, yeah. you know. So uh, that's just my personal opinion. I think he starts out in Lehigh, although you are right. Realistically, he will be given every shot to make the team. You're absolutely correct. The same thing will be Owen Tippett. You know, he'll, he'll be given every shot. Bobby Brink, Noah Cates, you know, all these young – Robbie Adder, all uh, Ronnie Adder, uh, you know, all these players, you know, or even Elliot Denoyer, where we haven't even mentioned him yet. Uh, he will be given every shot to make the team as well. But well, you're still going to need an AHL-ready team to, to to come in and at the drop of the hat, hey, you're up. You're the next man. Yeah, and you need talent at that level. You need to be able to score at that level as well. You're looking at Wade Allison can't stay healthy. Tanner Lezinski can't stay healthy. Both, listen, I'm very high on both, and I still am. Uh, I think they're really good players. And I think that they they definitely have a career in the the NHL. But if you can't stay healthy. It's going to be tough, yeah. I mean, you need to replace them somehow. So, and everyone wants to make a big thing about, you know, the right wingers having a log jam. That is correct. However, they can play the left wing as well. Uh, they can play off their offhand. I, I know it's not I know it's not ideal. I know the Flyers are one team that doesn't like to shift around, you know, players to play off their offhand, as you've seen, you know, uh, you know, with the exception for like Cam York and JBR at times. But uh, you know, Cam York, they were trying to fill a void just to see if it would work as a right-handed defenseman. Uh, JVR, it's in terms of placement on a line. Sometimes he had to be placed on the right side. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it's just, it just makes me think that Oscar Lindblom is now out. That, oh, that, but the, Jamie, the, we're we're jump we're jumping to different topics. We're talking about Connor McLennan. Hold on, let's yeah, let's yeah, let's focus. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah, all it's, good. <laughs> let's focus. Let's focus back on Connor McLennan. So. Uh, Vasily, do you want to, do you want to, uh, yeah, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll hop in on McLennan. Mm -hmm. I really just think, and the interesting thing that doesn't, you know, totally add up for me in my mind is that if you're Chuck Fletcher and you're, you know, touting the fact that, okay, the team needs Mm -hmm. high end talent, they need to be able to produce office. They need to be able to score goals, you know, at, at, uh, a bigger clip than they have been in the past. And that's even through the HL level, all the way to the NHL level and so on. Um, you're not signing your uh, prospect in your pool that had the highest amount of goals throughout this whole season. So that's one effect to it that's puzzling to me. The other thing that's puzzling is, as you said, Jamie, they're, they're 32 out of 50. So 
Well, ideally, they're going to want to come in at 48. That leaves them 16, you know, open contracts to add, essentially. You, you getting McLennan signed, I mean, it's a high um, or low risk, high reward type of move. Sure, he might not pan out. I mean, he's a six round pick. You might have a lot of other right wingers, but you could always place him in another position on the left wing, place him somewhere else. There's no excuse for not adding that type of talent or that type of potential to your prospect pool when you already are saying that you are lacking that in the first place. Um, another thing that doesn't really add up for me as well is that, I mean, you could say, okay, they want to leave room for some ELCs to sign through the players they draft, but most of those players that they might sign coming out of this draft will be slide eligible anyhow. So it's just overall, yes. puzz oh, overall puzzling stuff. I mean, I would have liked to see him get signed just based off the season he had and the fact that all the directives the Flyers gave him, he essentially met them. Um, I saw um, on Twitter and other various outlets that maybe they weren't you know, impressed with uh, his skating improvement. That's kind of why they let him go. But that's also something that he could continue to keep working on because he's only twenty, going to be 20 years old very soon. So it's not like he's I you know developed or fully, fully close to that point. So it just doesn't make a lot of sense uh, in terms of those things for me. Yeah, I think I think they saw him a little bit as a redundancy. That's the only thing I could really put it together. And he, yeah, they're kind of like, well, we have Brink, we have Konechny, we have a bunch of undersized kind of winger guys who can probably be so better than him. In the first place, then you know, then then go after <laughs> then go after a Swedish, you know, or a European player, or you know, where you get the four years as opposed to the two, yeah. you know, or tops, you know, three or another so goalie, three. if anything. Uh, I, mean, yeah, I think, goalie I think it's a fair point. Never hurt with an extra defenseman or like goaltender, like or, the, the, but also goaltend, the goaltending position is one of the most unpredictable in the sport of hockey. I just don't understand that selection. That was a waste of a pick. If they already knew, yeah, no, I agree. And stuff, it just you know, you know why I think it was it doesn't make sense. It, I, it, I think he was never supposed to drop that low to begin with, and I think they were like, well, he's the best player available. You know, but I don't think they ever really loved him because obviously for him to do what he did and then to get passed up, it's like, again, what more could he have done? So let's move on to the other two so we don't marinate too much on him. So um, uh, Owen McClellan sign, or doesn't sign. I'm uh, sorry, Owen McClellan and Ethan Sampson. They both don't get signed, but they get offers. This is obviously some kind of, I don't know, logistical loophole to maintain their their rights, but I do still think it's a really positive sign because, look, we're talking about two prospects who were taken later in the draft. They they are saying, hey, we're still considering giving you guys both an ELC. Just show us that you can do it again, you know, for the second year in a row because, quite frankly, the Flyers do have, maybe they lack some high-end, but they have a lot of these kind of middle-tier prospects or even like B-level prospects. Yeah. Tons of them, right? So I think it's a really good sign these two guys made the cuff. Obviously, we know uh, Ethan's father, Sean. We've had him on the podcast. Jamie, I know you know him. Um, yeah. You know, we reached yeah. out to him a little bit. Um, it, it's, I think Ethan Sansa could definitely be on the Phantoms for sure, just judging on what he brings. And then uh, you look at McClellan. I mean, uh, I did hear Russ Cohen say on, uh, I think it's Locked On Flyers podcast, where he was saying that, uh, Flair is a big fan of McClellan, McClellan's game, like what he brings. So I imagine, you know, we got more of a two way guy there, probably higher uh, pro upside, I guess, or a higher floor in McClellan's case. But he also had a really good season in his own right. I mean, he was also a point per game player in the U.S. Uh, Hockey League, above point per game player. So also did really well. So those people who think that, like, the McClellan passing up and the Flyers signed like two garbage guys and said, that is not the case. They beat out. I mean, if you if you look at them as a cluster of three, you know they beat out a really good prospect to do what they did. So, I think that's really exciting. Uh, Vasily, go to you first. What, what do you think about the the recent signings? Uh, I think it's a good sign. I mean, two younger players have performed well uh, this season in their respective leagues. So why not? Um, you know, extend the the bona fide offer just to ensure that the rights are retained, and then yeah. if they choose to accept, you have them signed to their ELCs. Um, you know, so. I, I see it as something that should have been done. And it's a good thing that they did do that because you're rewarding, you know, prospects that are in your development pool for strong seasons. And it shows other prospects that if they perform well, um, you know, the flyers won't hesitate um, to give them these types of offers um, just to, you know, get the statistics of it. Ethan Sampson, uh, 68 games a season, 15 goals, 28 assists, uh, 43 points. So that's uh, pretty good um, in his, 
essentially third full season in the WHL. Um, he, you know, showed some improvements in his skating stride this season as well. And that was something that the Flyers were looking for him. They like his mobility on the back end. So I really think the Flyers are high on him and just based on uh, how far he's come so far in his development. So I, I would say, you know, after next season, again, probably the WHL, I wouldn't be surprised to see him, um, you know, shift towards the Phantoms and then get a look from that point and continue his development. Uh, and then on the other hand, uh, McLaughlin, as well as you were saying, playing for Sioux City and U- uh, USHL, uh, had a great season uh, over – uh, 10 points per game. So 62 games played, 28 goals, 44 assists, 72 points, uh, and was a plus 19. So showing he can do it in all facets. Um, I know he was good on the penalty kill for them in the in the USHL as well. Um, so exciting. I mean, I guess you you have one prospect in a sense that's out of the pool now in McLennan, but then you get, you know, a guy like McLaughlin that kind of, I guess, could add in a, as a makeup for, for losing a guy like him. I still think they should have signed all three personally because they have the contract slots to do so. But it's good to see the other two sign because it looks like they do have upside, though it's probably going to be more of a slow burn for their development just based on where they're picking the draft and um, just, just um, you know, their skill sets in general. Yeah, and uh, committed to the University of North Dakota. for. Oh, I, I didn't season. know that. Yeah. Go ahead, Jamie. That's what I was just going to say. Uh, he's going to a renowned hockey program. Uh, the University of North Dakota is no joke. It's a very good hockey program, and that could only help is aid his development and and further, I think, and give him more experience, you know, at the NCAA level, playing against men. And uh, University of North Dakota, that's where, you know, Dave Haxtell came from. Uh, you know, there's a very good player. Zach Carice came from uh, the University of North Dakota. Yeah, uh, Jonathan Stahl. Taves. Yeah, t- t- I mean, th- th- that program is a renowned program. It's a very good hockey program. And there used to be a Flyers uh, oh, prospect. T.J. Oshie. Yeah, T.J. Oshie. Yeah, T.J. Oshie. Yes. That was really cool as well. Oh, in terms of Ethan Sampson, Vasily, you touched on it. In terms of his skating strides, his offensive game has always been there. That's what that's what he told me. But he said that he got away from that when I interviewed him uh, back in January. I think it was I interviewed him January or February. Uh, one of those months I, I interviewed him and uh, he said that his offensive game has always been there. He just got away from it the past few years, but he wanted to become more offensive. Now he never, I never dived, it delved uh, into it to see if the flyers asked him to become more offensive or they wanted to see more offense to his game just because it was my first time interviewing him. And I don't want to disrespect and think that I'm trying to get like breaking news and stuff like that. But the yeah. more I talk to him, like I am going to ask him that at developmental camp. He he should be there at dev camp, um, you know, in in July. So I I will definitely ask him if the Flyers asked him. You know, they want to see more to his offensive side of the game because he was very good in transition this past season. And the one thing that stuck out to me was his physicality as well. He's six foot three, one eighty. He's six foot three, one eighty three. He's not afraid to drop the mitts. He dropped the mitts numerous times this year for his teammates. He didn't like it. But the one, another quality, another aspect I like is that his shot accuracy. He may not have the hardest shot. He has a good shot, but it's highly accurate. He may, he hits the net nine times out of ten. And that's something I think that the Flyers need on the back end. If they want to utilize him on power play two, you know, or – hey, you know, he's on the penalty kill. I'm going to do a slapper down the ice, you know what I mean, so to speak, you know, around the wall, you know, whatever, you know, all these situations, you know, you know, as they go on for the Phantoms and to the fly, hopefully to the Flyers, you know, to the big, to the big leagues, uh, you never know what you're going to have to do. So uh, he makes good decisions with the pucks. And he another asp- another quality I saw about 10 or 11 games from him this past season is the way he stamps people up at the blue line. And that's a facet that I didn't see the Flyers, even with risk the line in back there too much, you know, happen this past season. So I like that aspect as well, to be honest with you. And, and McLaughlin, again, he's going to renowned hockey program. I think that, like your reef says, I think, hey, duplicate your season at the next level, at the NCAA level. Hey, Ethan, put together another solid year with the Cougars. You know, so it's not a fluke. Show it's not a show. It's not a fluke. Like exactly. one. So it's not a fluke. And we'll ELC you next year. That that's that that's my take from that. Yeah, I think I think so too. I think 
I think that's and and I you know I, I don't think it's very fair to the players. Um, but I think considering the case that the Flyers again have a lot of prospects in that area, um, it's kind of understandable. It it Flyers have this weird thing where we don't have enough of the top end guys with a bunch of the guys in between. So I think right now trying to ruffle through that, but it makes you think like, hey, why aren't you packaging some of these guys? Um, though I guess you kind of make the argument they did with Connor Bonham and German Rutsov. Um, so you, th- that was another point I wanted to bring up, actually, Get, swinging back to the Connor McClendon thing, right? You mentioned German Rutsov. You mentioned Connor Bonham, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If the Flyers already knew that, okay, his skating wasn't there at the trade deadline because that was more than adequate enough time to know. Why didn't you trade him? Yeah. yeah. Like Hexy did with keep him running. I brought that up to people, and people were like, well, how did you, how do you, maybe he wasn't worth anything. I was like, so what? You couple him in a deal, you know, to save either A, a pick going the other way or exactly. something like that. The Flyers are in a situation where they need as much draft capital as possible, yeah. you know, with this aggressive retool or whatever we're going to go through this offseason, <laughs> you know, or the next or the following year. You know? I love that you have, I love that you said whatever we're going through. Cause it's so true. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. What, what harm is it to say, hey, okay. Give me a six round pick for him. Because well, you know simple, what? You get drafted in a six round. Tom Brady was drafted in the yeah, six Yeah, it's round. simple it's asset management, asset too. Management. Like, huh? It's simple asset management just for the fact that, I mean, if you have an asset you don't think you're going to resign and use, why wouldn't you try to take that asset and turn it into something else that you this can is, potentially use, right? So I don't, this I don't is really the second understand. Time this has happened to him. Why yeah. a call was the first. Yeah. And, and somebody told me today, well, his family didn't want him to get drafted. I can't buy that either. Like, why wouldn't his family want him to get drafted if he entered the draft? Like, that that, that, that statement right there didn't make sense to me, but everyone's entitled to their opinion because, honestly, at the end of the day... I don't know you if know, you have control. I don't think you have it, control of, of whether you get entered in the draft or not. I, I mean, I'm going to be honest with you, Reef. I don't know if you can or not. You know, No, I don't like, think... Because there was that case with the... I'm sorry to cut you off, but there, there was that case with that, that kid who got drafted by the Montreal Canadiens who was oh, like yeah. being accused yeah. for statutory rape or something. Accused, again, I don't know what the story was. But he even asked, he said, hey, don't draft me. And Montreal drafted him anyway. Yeah. Well, that's... Well, it's like that's up to the organization. Point. Yeah. That's a good point. That, honestly, that's... That, yeah. You know what? I didn't even think of that. that, that that's a great point, actually. It's new in my mind, but yeah. The person may actually be true. But in, in any sense, they why didn't you trade Wild Corner then? You know, if they already... I think, uh, if, I, I think they wanted to sign him. I think they wanted to sign. Yeah. I, so I agree. But if they knew that Wyatt didn't want to sign, like, I don't know. I don't know if they did know. I think, I think there was, I think they were trying to convince him until the end and yeah, they just probably. lost him. You know, kind of like what Kevin Hayes t- did to the um, Chicago Blackhawks. Right. Yeah. And Adam Fox did the Chicago Blackhawks. But in any, in any case, I mean, to, it hasn't come out or we haven't, we don't have the insight that like McLennan didn't want to sign. So at this Actually, point, what we heard leave. was the the opposite. Yeah, right? that he was interested, right? So yeah. that's what I mean. So he's he not in a make... position to turn down a contract. Yeah, exactly. Right. Ka- so Colin that's, that's is different way. because yeah. he was an overager, older player. He is the he is the option. Like Jay O'Brien's going to have that next year, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. but a guy like McLennan, like, and he's also not like he's like a B minus prospect. It's not like he. Is a uh, a guy, a fire thing. Yeah, yeah, that's the thing. He kind of got lost in the shuffle, and the thing that worries us is that we're looking for a five, eight, sixty point guy right now. If that's possible, we're not so much looking for uh, you know, a fourth line or a third line players putting up thirty points. Like that's not as interesting to us right now. We're looking for somebody who's you know potentially high impact. So I think as a fan base, it just looks weird to us. But overall, I think I don't actually don't think it's that bad. I think. We're just over touchy about everything. And I've brought this up before. It's like, if I poke you once, it's not a problem. But if it's like all the, like this fan base has been beat the fuck up over the past two years. And so we didn't actually even really talk about this. So should have talked about this from the very beginning. And I apologize. We talked about the pre-show, but they're, they're like, we're going to keep doing this, uh, this theme thing that we've been talking about. Um, and like the one that we're going with today is, um, you know, what's the mindset of building like a resilient team? Like, how do you build a resilient team? Like, what what does it make to build a resilient team? Are we one? Do we have any elements of a resilient team? Are there certain players on our teams that can be considered resilient? So as I guess we move forward with the rest of the show, 
we can kind of keep that overlapping. I think guys like a guy like Ethan Sansom, I will say, I think he checks that box. You know, I don't know if Connor McLennan does. I will say that. And I don't know if Owen McClellan does, but McLennan chilled for the fact that he's smaller. That makes it again, a disadvantage. Uh, and McClellan is just, I haven't seen enough of him and I don't really know what his ceiling is, but having a right-handed big time defenseman who's two way, if he pans out even to be a number six defenseman, a good one in the NHL for Ethan, that's, Sam, an asset. that's definitely something that makes his team better. None of these are impact moves though at the end of the day. So while it is frustrating, I don't think any of us are like pissed, pissed. Something no. that could get us pissed is the coaching thing, but I don't know how they can screw that one up. Cause I think everybody's pretty open. Um, but Real quick, I do I do want to bring this up though too because it got kind of got lost in my shuffle, um, just because the news has been slow. Sandheim did win a silver medal. I think he has yep. four points, one goal, three assists in yeah. uh, the tournament. Um, pretty cool. Uh, the IHA, IIHF tournament. For those who are not aware, of the international tournaments that happen after the season. Um, it's cool that it happened. Not that surprising, um, considering the type of tournament it is. I don't think the points really matter that much, but. Good to see Santa was playing more hockey. It's such a weird off season. It's like I just want this goddamn draft to show up, and uh, we're going to yeah. talk about the draft. We're going to talk about coaching today as well. Um, but what do you guys think about Sandheim uh, getting the silver? And- uh, it's good to see him. You know, continue to get some points as he was doing for the Flyers this season uh, with Team Canada. Um, I don't believe that his usage was um, exactly the same as it was to the to the Flyers. Like he still got a decent amount of minutes. But I, I don't think it was to the level that the Flyers were playing him to the end of the season, like 24, 25 minutes. So, I mean, it, interesting for him to obviously play with different players, get that experience at the, the national level for Team Canada. He obviously played in a lot of World Juniors. So it's probably good for him to get back with Hockey Canada. Um, I mean, as a Canadian, I would have liked to see uh, the Canadians come out with the goal. But it was a good game. I watched that final. Nice overtime winner by Finland. Um, but congrats to Sandheim on the silver and congrats to Finland there on, on the goal. It was a good tournament. Word. Jamie, got any thoughts on San Sandheim? Yeah, I, I, I thought he'd put together a solid tournament. Uh, you know, he was a Flyers best defenseman this past season and it's good to get him a uh, silver medal for his, uh, you know, attributes or achievements, you know, for, for this season. I think that was the uh, icing on the cake that, you know, I think he's ready to take the next step and, become that uh, defenseman, hopefully that, uh, you know, the Flyers invented him and, and most fans did as well. Uh, some fans, you know, were falling off the bus there with uh, Sanheim, but like, you know, Bill, you know, we've talked, had a lot of talks with Bill about this, you know, it's hard to find quality defensemen that play 20, that could play 20 plus minutes a night. Uh, exactly. And sometimes in upwards of 27 or 28 minutes at times. Um, and, and, and a good skating one at that. And Sandheim is a very good skater. So um, to me, uh, it, it was the icing on the cake. But did you want to answer that resiliency or are we going to answer that throughout the show? I mean, you could just, we're going to yes. answer it throughout the show. So if you yeah, want to talk about it with Sandheim and resiliency. I think the uh, resiliency, I think, is uh, Travis Sandheim. A lot of the fan base were falling off, you know, the bus from him. And I think, that even some of the top brass, you know, were maybe maybe at, at times getting frustrated in Sam Himes' development. It seemed that he did stall for whatever reason uh, that, that he stalled. But this past season, something seemed to click. And it wasn't right away either. It was like uh, it was a rocky first month of the season for him. And then after that first month, I think he bounced back and played, had a very good season. Uh, it was arguably the uh, – the Flyers best defenseman. Yeah. As a collective team, the Flyers haven't been a resilient team since the 1920 team. And I hate to say it, but Chuck Fletcher is absolutely right when he, when he says that this team should become or try to get back to the 1920 team. And that was part of it. How many times did you see that group get down and come back? They could be down two or three goals and they fight and claw their way back and, and overcome and, you know, you know, went outlast the game and win the game four to three. The Flyers were 0-40-1 this past season when they trailed by two goals or more. 0-40-1. That's yeah. a hell of a stat. That's a hell of a stat. 
Had yeah. the game they trailed by two or more goals, and they comically bad one in regulation. That is one hell of a stat, and that that to me shows the problem. Like it, even if we, even if the Flyers had a healthy Brian Ellis and Sean Couturier, okay, the the wheels on the bus were falling off during the time that Coots ended his season, or hey, you you were out the season. They were on their second leg of what became their 10-game losing streak, their second 10-game losing streak of the season. They had one under Coots, and then then they overcame it and went on, uh, went on a three- or four-game winning streak and then went on, what, an 11-game losing streak, wasn't it? Wasn't it yeah. 11? But when he got hurt, when he was told that he couldn't play the rest of the season, that was the fourth straight loss of that second leg of that uh, that – what became the eleven game losing streak? <laughs> so already still happening essentially at that point. That's I mean, what the, I mean. The so losing even, streak that's never ended. Yeah. Even with Sean Couturier, they were still they still lost an identity, didn't have an identity, and weren't resilient at all. And there were certain players, I think, that became resilient. I think that Scott Lawton was very resilient. I think that Cam Atkinson was resilient, and he was very outspoken. I would say Kevin Hayes was resilient. Uh, you look at how many injuries he had, uh, the loss of his brother coming in, and then he got healthy and actually played solid down the stretch, maybe not the last five or six games, but he's always been streaky that way anyway. But I think that he was he was pretty resilient. I would say Travis Konechny was pretty resilient. His development stalled there for you know about half first half of the season. Uh, as soon as a- AV got fired, a light bulb came on, and uh, under Mike Yo, he actually played well. Uh, he actually produced what forty-five of his fifty-two points or something under. Yeah, under almost point, point a Mike game Mike. under Yo. Uh, so I think certain players were in on the uh, defensive side of the puck. People don't like this guy, but I'm going to say Ivan Provorov because you know honestly he struggled. It was a very tough season for him. And, uh, you know, he struggled all the way up until around like January, February. And then from then on, I thought he put, I thought he, the last two and a half months of the season, I thought he was, he, he was, a, I thought he was their best defenseman for the last two and a half. He months. like sandwiched the season with good play. Yeah. So I, I, I didn't know? even say that he was even resilient. Uh, people don't want to admit that. And that's fine uh, because, you know, of, you know, his, his media, you know, what happened with the media this year. Uh, you know, at exit interviews and a couple of that because of the uh, tweets and him reading Twitter or Facebook or something like that and getting heavily involved, you know, or something of that nature. But uh, you, you got to give credit where it's due. You got to be objective, season, right? Season, I thought he played well. Once he started playing with Cam York, that's when he started to play well. Which well makes I, sense. I, you play with a better player or better players, your performance <laughs> is going to be better in general. Um, the resilience thing, I mean, it's, it's hard to gauge, like from a team overall perspective. I think the stat that you uh, brought up earlier, they're, they're what, 0 40 and 3 when trailing. 0, 40 yeah. oh, 40 and 1. Okay. When trailing uh, after two goals or, or over. I think as a team, it shows just that shows that no, they are not resilient whatsoever <laughs> at no. all. Um, but as you said, individually, player wise, there's certain things to pick up on where, you know, certain guys underperformed and bounced back and actually played well or ended the season well. Or in Kevin Hayes' instance, you know, he fought back from in- injuries and that shows, you know, he has the mindset to bounce mm-hmm. back from certain complications or certain things that might be affecting him over a season. Um, so there's certainly players that are there and are resilient. And that's a positive going forward because you can take that resiliency individually and try to expand it and have it, you know, affect the team um, on a more, a more wide scale basis. I think what it really starts with in terms of resiliency as a team is the buy-in. And, and I think it really starts with coaching. And and that's why the coaching hire coming up is such a big and important hire mm-hmm. because if you do not bring in a coach that gets these players to buy into a system, buy into an identity and want to put it on the line for each other and play for each other. They're never going to be resilient. And if you look at the best teams, that's where resiliency is bred out of, right? It's bred out of, you know, having a system and identity that you ascribe to as a team. And when things are going bad and you're losing three, nothing in the middle of the second period, you go back into the locker room and you say to each other as a group, you know what, boys, 
we have this identity. We're going to play this way. Even though we're losing right now, we're going to stick to our guns. We're going to stick to our game plan, stick to our systems. And that's going to help us overcome. And if we stick to our game in the way that we are supposed to play the game and, and how we're supposed to protect the lead and do all the right things on the ice, then the results will come and we'll be able to come back in the game. And I think a lot of uh, the Flyers' problems in terms of resiliency came from that, where when things got tough this season, they broke out of the systems and out of their structure and they weren't following, you know, what the coaches kind of wanted them to do on the ice. And you would kind of see games blow up on them. I think, I mean, if you look at Mike Yo's press conferences, the, the later half of the season, um, he was very forthright in that. And, and in those situations where, you know, he said, we just weren't playing on the same page or we weren't playing with structure. Or we weren't playing how we should be playing. I think that's why, you know, at the end of the season, even though fans were saying, okay, and, and media was saying, you know, it's best for the Flyers to get the worst draft pick, not necessarily because there's a lot of players that are going to be care that are going to be carried over um, from this past season into the following season's roster and learning how to win, learning how to play defensively in your own end in a tight game, learning, you know, those crucial habits that are a part of executing a system in the NHL that's what you really need to be a resilient team. And I think that the Flyers kind of lost that um, yeah. at the beginning of the season uh, through Elaine Vigneault's firing. They gained some of it back throughout the season. They did have some good performances under Mike Yo, But I really think a lot of the resiliency comes back to the coaching and just being able to find a coach that can get a, a team uh, to buy into his systems and buy into the identity and the culture that he wants You know, the Philadelphia Flyers to be represented by. And that's something that's been unclear I think the last two seasons, they haven't had an identity. They haven't had a, you know, a style of play that you could watch them and say, well, you know what? That's how the Flyers play. That's how the Flyers That's play. How, exactly. Can't you say can't, it for the past few years. You actually. can't pinpoint, you can't pinpoint it. Right. So it was like the, the Flyers played around the power play because it was Claude Giroux. Yeah. That was the Flyers identity. Now the identity is a bunch of guys that nobody really has a good beat on them. Who the heck knew? Yeah. yeah. Who and, knows? Like, I'm going to be honest. The, the one thing that irritated me about the Flyers this season is that they didn't reward players yeah. uh, that they should have. Like, Sanheim should have gotten more power play time. I agree, I agree. You know, uh, I did like the aspect of giving Cam York power play time when he was up and recalled. Mm -hmm. I like that aspect because they have to see what they have in him. But to see a guy like, for instance, like Bobby Brink comes – no offense to Bobby Brink either because I, I thought he had some good games under the Flyers. Uh, it, you know, with the big club. But Bobby Brink comes, signs his contract, and boom, he's immediately put on the power play by Sam Himes on the bench watching. Like, uh, you know, and it's like, what do I have to do to get on the power play? Uh, yeah. Why didn't I get a shot? And I think that, well, you know, he, that's why I say he's so resilient is because he handles it with class. And he'll never well, I think, he, I think Yo told him why, because he told us publicly, but doesn't mean we it doesn't mean you would agree with him or I would agree with him but I he, don't. yeah he was saying one he's like oh he's like when we limit Sandheim off the power play uh we limit his struggles he was like as soon as we put him on the power play he seems to struggle a little bit more I don't know if that's actually true but I do remember well, you saying that I don't understand the correlation though you know I wonder like because I heard this uh earlier in the se midway through the season too or maybe towards the latter parts from a press conference and it was from one of the players, uh, Morgan Frost, actually, it was exit interviews. Uh, he says, you know, I, I'm not afraid to make a mistake anymore and be sent back. Uh, you know, uh, I, I feel like I'm an everyday NHL player now. And, uh, you know, I, I've come to, you know, realize that. And after the trade deadline is when he knew he was going to stay up for good. He said he became more comfortable. And that's why he when saw Owen Tippett arrived. Huh? Because I he actually... Wasn't I think I think that's true, but I also think it's when Owen Tippett showed up on the team. Right. So I get that, and I understand that, but it leads me to this point. Is Sanheim afraid to make a mistake on the power play and be moved off? Like why, why? Yeah, potentially. Why, why not? Why are certain players given longer leashes while other players aren't? Like, it well, doesn't make any sense. And for he's, me... He, Sorry, like, Jamie. No, he's an adequate veteran. Uh, he's yeah. a veteran of the game now. Uh, like I don't understand. I'm confused by that. To be honest, a lot of it. A lot of it. I think. I mean, for me, reading between the lines, it seems like uh, the players on the roster right now. They're you know they obviously want to be communicated to clearly, and they deal better with you know a clear, concise communication for their coach, which is kind of what Mike Yo was bringing to the table. I honestly think that with Elaine Vigneault, there could have been a lot of mixed messaging involved to players. Obviously, we can't confirm that we're not in the locker room. 
But based on, you know, just the switch over and seeing some players bounce back immediately, like Konechny, Sandheim, seeing him excel more under Yo, it leads me to believe, and the proof is in the pudding really, that, um, you know, Vino and his staff weren't really communicating as well as they should have been to players. And maybe that's why you get those statements from Morgan Frost saying, well, you know, I was afraid to make a mistake because I didn't know where I stood on the team. Mm -hmm. Whereas with Mike Yo. I mean, he was straight to the point with players. He kind of gave them, okay, I want you to work on this. I want to see this out of you. And it wasn't, you know, if I'm making a mistake, something, you know, something's going to be taken away from me, but it's more of a learning process. And that's why, I mean, in previous episodes and even, um, you know, in, in some articles I've written, I was just talking about how it's important for the next coach to really be a communicator for these guys. Cause it seems yeah. as though they perform better under a guy that gives them, um, you know, concise, clear communication on what he wants from them. But, but yeah. honestly, like I totally agree with that, but like if you're a coach and that's not what you're doing, you should not be an NHL coach. But apparently that's what was happening under Vino. He was, he was mixed messaging. They had the <clears throat> Michelle Terry as like a, kind of liaison between him and the players i don't know but yeah which i think he probably did in the past but again it depends who was his assistant coach you know that's, again who's his like, assistant coach michelle terry and that's yeah, a, it, no better you know what, they're about to hire their fifth coach in six seasons and and, and i'm just like i'm tired of seeing all these well so really so am. I, I totally agree. So what do you guys think about the names that are obviously out there? Obviously, there's the Barry Trotz. I don't think anybody would be upset. Tortorella, I think everybody can live with, you know, and, and obviously he's got a great reputation. Um, I think Jim Montgomery is probably the most intriguing option as far as yeah. like what That's can the guy I like do? Hire. Yeah. Well, I, the reason I brought this up before and I, I know he's your number one, Vasily, but like yeah. The reason I like the idea of him a lot is like I want like this team has been counted out. Yeah. That's it. All all hope, all expectations. Like the Dallas Stars. Are, they're gone. What? Like the Dallas Stars were. Yeah. Yeah. They were well, counted out too. And he had them rocking. Well, that that's kinda of, I was like, we need a redemption story. I was like, this is a guy who not that, you know, obviously he's doing well. He's not he's still a rich man and all that, but like he needs to come back into coaching. Like, like this is a team that needs Reinjection. It needs these players need to be told that they're talented again. Like, yeah. like I know that everyone's like, oh, let's get a hard ass in there to like, like get them in line. It's like, it's like, yeah, okay. I I want them to remember that they're great players. I don't want them to be like, oh, I'm going to be Ben. So we were just talking about that. Like, I want them yeah. to go out there and stop thinking so much. Yeah, <laughs> I and I mean, by all accounts, too. Like, um, Montgomery is a really great communicator just based off like the stuff that I've researched and just players talking about him in the past hand, like um, in that coaching article I wrote maybe a week and a half or so ago, um, you know, Devin Shore gets into the fact that he uh, and his experiences with Montgomery, he always knew where he stood, knew what he wanted out of, out of him, knew what he was looking for out of his performances on the ice. And I think that's a crucial thing when you're a player, you want to know what the coach is expecting out of you. But just going back to the theme of resilience. Torts would do that. Yeah, Torts too. But even going back to the theme of like resiliency and being a resilient team, um, you know, Jim Montgomery, that's the ideal picture of resiliency to me. I mean, think about what he went through. I mean, um, you know, with with his struggles with alcoholism and then bouncing back as an assistant and being very successful with St. Louis uh, and then potentially getting, you know, into another head coaching role, that's, um, you know, the, the optimal, um, re resilient coach in my eyes, just, just based on that. And I think that's something, and somebody that, you know, could build a resilient mentality with the team, uh, just through that, those experiences and say, you know what, I, you know, went to the bottom of the barrel. I had to overcome some things and this organization needs to overcome some things. And I know that I can help them do that, you know, through his past experience. So I think, I think in terms of resiliency, he'd be a great coach just based off that and what he's been through himself. So, so. Yeah, no, I, I, I think I think the names we mentioned, I really believe that those are the, the top three options we're gonna end up with. Maybe maybe I'm wrong. Montgomery, I, Trotz, and I don't think it? Trotz is that like I people are super down on the flyers. I, I understand what people are saying. I get the appeal of Winnipeg. I, I get all this. At the end of the day, the Flyers are an extremely wealthy organization. They're a big city. They are not an expensive city, so your taxes and all that won't be as high as some of the other places. Cost of living here is reasonable. It's not far from Barry Trotz's current city that he's been playing in and the, and the city he was playing in prior to that. Uh, 
and there is enough talent here. And this is also what I was kind of saying to the point where like, I actually don't know if I want a coach. And I know this maybe maybe because I'm an ignorant idiot, you know, but like I don't necessarily want a coach before the draft. And I actually don't agree with a lot of the common consensus. It's like, oh, you need to bring a coach in here so he can tell you what he wants on his team. I don't really I, I don't agree with any of that stuff. I think I think you need to build the, the culture and the, whatever coach that you bring in, he needs to adapt to whatever it is that you have. You, this whole like Chip Kelly, if you remember that facility, I don't know if you know yeah. that story here. This whole idea of like find my players at work. I, I don't believe in it that shit. I believe the idea is you find a collection of great players. You know, like was John Cooper like, oh no, please don't take the great players from my lineup? You know, was he like he was probably like, hey, I don't want to lose Barclay Goudreau. I don't want to lose Blake Coleman. He did. He's adapted, though, and that just the sh- shows the merits of a good coach. That's right? my point. It's you like, should be able to get results with any roster if you are a good coach. You, you should be able job. to get the most out of it, even if they're not a good team. Even if yeah. they're not a good team. You should be able to get the most out of it. So I don't agree with anybody on that. If a coach comes in here as part of the process, great. Okay. Dave Haxtell was here for that. Didn't change much. The only thing I, I would think actually is like, well, what if the the cards fall our way during the draft? What if Shane Wright falls to five, which I think is absolutely possible, and the Flyers get Shane Wright? You know, and I don't think it's going to happen, but I'm just saying. Or let's say they just get Logan Cooley, or they get or Slavkovsky, or they just have a nice name, and all of a sudden you look at the prospect pool. Like, realistically, they could because it's all uh, possible. If you, have, if you have one team take Simone Nemec. That leaves David Yurasek, who would yeah. be the second, you know, defenseman. So if you get another team to bite and take David Yurasek, what are Someone's you doing? Someone's dropping, yeah. yeah. Exactly. So you're pushing either Shane Wright, Logan Cooley, or Slavkowski so, you know, down to five. Uh, and, one of them. So, Not saying one of them. I'm saying at least one. Corey, we'll- Corey, Proudman, Corey Proudman just released the, uh, his latest rankings. And again, I think these rankings are going to be all over the place. I want to make this very clear. This is not gospel, wow. but he did just rank Yuri Slavkovsky as number one overall in the draft. Shane Wright at two, Logan Cooley at three, David Yurichek at four, Simon Nemich at five, six, Cutter Gauthier, seven, Joachim Kemmel, uh, eight, Matthew Savoy, nine, Marco Casper, wow. and 10, Daniela Yurov, which actually is not surprising Yurov. for Yurov at all. But I came out with that first, uh, I came out with the first round mock draft this past week. And it's sort of on the same lines as where Corey Prom and it has all these players that you just mentioned. But, I might be, but nobody off. has right at two. He's the only no, person to put no, right I at two. Not, I did not have Slavkovsky going but, to the New Jersey Devils. Now, I think that it, it's easy because I know he attends the Worlds. So I think, you know, the Worlds got the best and he saw what Slavkovsky did at Worlds. So that move bumped Shane Wright, I mean, a down, down a peg. Uh, sorry, it bumped Shane Wright down a peg, uh, in my opinion. And that's based off the Worlds. Uh, Wright just didn't have a great – he didn't have gonna, a great season. Yeah, I'll tell you what's going to happen. I'll tell you what's going to happen. It's going to be interesting at the scouting combine in Buffalo. And and I think when, – when's that? Like June 22nd or something of that nature? Yeah. Uh, that, that, that's well, going to be your end-all. He, here's, okay. my point, here's my point, though, Jamie, is if Yuri Slavkovsky is taken first overall – have you guys ever seen the movie uh, Draft Day? It's a Disney yeah. movie with yeah. Kevin Kevin Costner, I think. Yeah. So and like that's what happened. They pass up on the on the guy ranked first overall, and everybody starts freaking out. Now again, that's just a movie, right? But I look at the scenario here, and all of a sudden, and I think I think the NHL teams are more prepared for this than we are personally. But I think we're expecting things to be lined up. I think this year there's really no true number one. It's very difficult to call any of these guys true number one. And I think at any point it could be Slavkovsky and then New Jersey could be like, we need a defenseman. I'm going for David Yurichek. If I can get myself a more cider, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to go for it. I got nothing. To, I got nothing to lose here. I got a packed prospect pool. Then all of a sudden you have Slavkovsky and Yurichek. And then what? Wright goes at three or there, or then there they go, well, maybe there's something wrong with Wright. Are we going for Cooley? Oh, wait, there, and then there's still other names available. All I'm saying is it takes one or two wild card the moves. Board, yeah. things to, the board, yeah. I, I will say I'm high on a few players. I'm high on Cutter Gauthier. 
I'm high yeah. on uh, you know Joaquin Kemmel. I think that's a player that the Flyers could use. A lot of people say about a shoulder injury and whatnot. I like Cutter Gauthier because he's not afraid to take the hit to make the play, and 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 that that's the type of player I think the Flyers need. But I, um, do you think I, Matthew Savoy is now probably not going to get picked considering the um, way they treated McLennan and? So I've been going back and forth in this in my in in my head, and no, I had to say he's still on the board, and I say he's still on the board. <laughs> The Flyers scouted still an option. You mean? Closely. Yeah, yeah. The Flyers scouted Winnipeg very closely this year. It was Savoy, uh, coupled with uh, their what's the other guy's name? Um, Geeky. Huh? Geeky. Connor Geeky. Geeky. Connor Geeky. Connor Geeky. Yeah, Connor Geeky. Yes, and, and, and I like Connor Geeky, but the problem I have with Connor Geeky is his transition play. He tends to have he needs a playmaker to play with to feed him the puck. Um, he doesn't really carry the play up the ice. That that's my only downside to Connor Geeky, but the so where I'm getting at is that the Flyers scouted Winnipeg very closely this year, no doubt about it, and that's what, I think that's why they knew or had an understanding of Connor McLennan is because of Matthew Savoy, because of Connor Geeky, you know, um, and Winnipeg was a stock team, so yeah. I mean, the Flyers watched them very closely, and I I, I man I'm. No, I say that Savoy is still on the board, is still in play. Uh, yeah. It would have been nice to have his buddy in terms of Connor McLennan, you know, signed and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, you know, Savoy wants to get drafted and play in the NHL. Yeah. And he's he's highly talented. I, I really think um, it could go anywhere. I mean, as you see with a lot of mock drafts, a lot of players are all over the place. And so it's hard to kind of project, hard to predict. And as you were saying, it takes one out of the box, one off the board type of pick, yeah. and then somebody falls. And uh, from that point, I mean, anything can really happen. The Flyers might have a chance to select somebody that they might Ooh. not have thought. Um, personally, I mean, I think it's going to be uh, between uh, Kemmel and Savoy, I think, as, as their picks. I think they're going to go with either of those guys, um, just, just based off a hunch and just based off kind of what they need. Um, preferably, uh, I've been watching a little bit more of Kamel and just like in-game highlights, stuff like that. And he looks like the real deal and, and looks like somebody, at least for me, that probably should be even ranked higher than he is, um, in, in a lot of, you know, people's mock drafts, he seems to be, be a bit lower. Yeah. Well, and we I had kinda, Cornianos has him as yeah, a, his, yeah, Steve essentially had him number two. one. Yeah. Steve Dude. had him at two. And, and I mean, just based off watching, I, I can't really see much flaws to his game other than the fact that his skating stride kind of needs to get cleaned up a little bit. But that's, I mean, as we were saying earlier, that's what most of the young guys and most of the young players entering the league have a little bit choppiness to their stride that can be cleaned up, which is easily done now by teams and their power skating coaches and just the, the way they're developing their prospects. So that's not something to be worried about. Um, yeah. So I, I would say Kamel or Savoy for the Flyers most likely, but I mean, if Cooley drops to five and, and I'm Chuck Fletcher, I, I'd have to go with him because that, that's oh, yeah. my number one um, yeah. in, in mind. I, I would go, uh, like right now for me, it's uh, Cooley, um, Wright, and then Slavkovsky, and then um, Savoy, Kamal, Nemec, six. So, Yeah, Cooley's still my number one. Uh, I think – we interviewed, we interviewed him last month. It's amazing. Yeah. Very good guy. Did he uh, say he wanted to go to the Flyers? <laughs> you know, not very. Uh, he he's ready to go to whomever drafts him. To be yeah, honest, yeah, of with course, you. of course. Like most prospects, right? So, but um, yeah. I mean, this draft is like your reef was saying, you know, earlier, and like you touched on, Facilia, uh, it's very unpredictable. I mean, like like I, I hate to say it, but Morris Cedar did raise the bar there a little bit, you know, in terms of drafting. well, that's why a guy like uh, Juracek is rated so high. Yeah. Yeah. Big physical mobile defenseman with a two way game. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I, I mean, you're a check. He, he'd be a nice player. Uh, but I, I, I'm higher on Nemec than I am, uh, you're a check, but that's just me. I agree as well. Yeah. I mean, here's the one thing we can say is that, like, if Ryan Ellis, and I brought this up in the last podcast, is Ryan Ellis is out. This franchise that could change a lot. For that could draft. definitely I mean, change who they draft. People say go best player, best player available. But they're but all I mean, the best player available. They're all, they're all. I, I mean, in certain cases, yeah. But th those defensemen are both, you know, very talented and look like they have upside and the ability, to, you know, to be 
well, uh, top pairing, at least based on, I haven't watched a ton of them, but I mean, based off what Steve who, was telling us, who's really clued in, he said, right, they have top pairing potential. So what, that's something that could be. What would you rather power. have? What would yeah. you rather have? A number two defenseman or a number okay. two center? Hmm. Like, just based off, uh, if that, are you saying that that's what this so pick like, will amount Connor, to? Let, let's just say Matthew Savoy's ceiling is a number two center, right? Okay. A 70 point player in the NHL. Not that great at D, but can put up points. And then your other option is a guy like David Juracek, who is a 24-minute defenseman who puts up 40. It's like Provrov. Puts up 40 yeah. points a, a year, 40, 50 points a year, maybe maybe even 60, and is just super physical and you know eats up a lot of minutes. And maybe he's not a number one guy, but he's complimentary number one guy. You I know. mean, it all depends on the health situation of Ellis. I'll lean Savoy if Ellis is healthy. If oh, not, probably probably the defenseman uh, if he isn't healthy. But realistically, I mean, the Flyers do have defensive prospects in the system that we haven't seen the most out of yet. Like, you don't really know where Cam York's but, game's going to get none, to. But none, none like Juracek. Yeah, yeah, none to Nemich, that. Nemich, I think you can make a case. We have Cam York. Yeah, that's true. Well, so none no, to he's the not same, a righty. I guess none, none to the same pedigree. I mean, though I will say, I mean, I, I still believe that, you know, Zamula will will have the ability to, you know, play well, in the top four. Not to that extent, but... Well, getting I a top-rated yeah. defenseman in a draft is something the Flyers haven't been able to do much of. Mark Last Howell. time was Provorov, right, where they yeah. had... It was Hannafin, Provorov, or Wierenski, and all three of them hit. So it's like, you yeah. didn't really... I know people probably want to argue that, but a hand before, if it was considered a bust. Before Provorov, what, Yoni Pitkinen before that, Mark yeah. Howe, so they're organizationally... And people considered him a bust, too, because he was yeah. a complimentary top-pairing yeah. guy. I, I'm strictly Number going two. on you know, next season, right? Because yeah. say if they drafted, say, if they drafted one of Nemec or Juracek, you're, you're hoping that... They're well, they were playing the minors, right? Right away. Yeah, that's what I was going to say right away. You're hoping that they become Either one, yeah. So where I'm getting that, NHL. I think that the number two center, to me, is more critical of need. Yeah, I agree. Kevin Hayes has been playing out of position for the past few years. Uh, he's not a two but seed. We, but we should say this, though, is whatever we're drafting, we're not drafting for next year. Even if it's a number one center, like let's say we let's just say we get Logan Cooley, right? And let's say he has potential to be a number one center, which I, I think he does, right? Yeah, he's not going to be yeah. a number one center next year. We're drafting for a number three yeah. at most. He's committed anyway. He's going to I, uh, uh, where Northeastern, I think. Yeah, I, I did see an article on NHL.com that said to Minnesota. I did see that he's trying to make the NHL, though. So I think in his mind, if he can make the NHL, he might go straight into the NHL because he'll, yeah. get, he'll get paid. Um, I'm just... But the Flyers need the Flyers haven't drafted a goal scorer, and I don't even know how. You, you know, I'm saying in the first round. You know, well like, they did, yeah. they did. Tyson Forrester, well, Tyson Forrester. But I, I mean, he's, leg he's legitimate. It was a goal scorer in the draft. You know, yeah. I mean, that was his specialty. I, I'm just. They need top six talent. Uh, yeah, yeah they, no, they, no, they, no doubt about that. <laughs> they, to well, me. Well, Go ahead, I, I, I'd James. go with if if Cooley fell, that's my number two. That that's my number one. Yeah, I would o agree. Over yeah. over, I've said it over and over again. Over Shane Wright. If you give me between, if you give me between Slavkovsky, Wright, and Cooley, I'm still taking Cooley. Yeah. Um, having said that, I wouldn't be upset with any any of the guys right now ranked in the top five. I wouldn't be upset with. I would not be upset about, and that that excludes Savoy and Kamel, who I also would not be upset about. That doesn't include Cutter Gautier as well, who's kind of on the brink there. But literally, Shane Wright, Slavkovsky, Cooley, Nemec, Juracek, Savoy, Kamel. Those realistically is the top seven, right? Yeah. Would yeah. you guys agree with that? I, I'll agree, yeah. 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 I agree with that. That's a pretty darn good uh, top seven there. <laughs> and, and watch like uh, fucking Frank Nazer uh, be the best player to come out of the draft. Um, Never know. It's always possible. Like, who, who thought Claude Giroux was going to be as good as he was at, you know, pick number 22? Well, well, you know, um, to. It, there's a lot of like these Russian kids, and, you know, 
They're unpredictable. Yeah, yeah. A lot of like, the, how good is Yurov, dude? I've heard, I've heard arguments that Yurov's second most talented player in the draft. Yeah, he's top. I've, yeah, I've heard people say that he could be uh, easily a top five pick. But so you can get I him mean, at ten, and he's yeah, but there's out. some, but there's some teams apparently uh, dropping, you know, Russian players off their draft board. Yeah. Um, and that you know brings us to another topic we had on our list was that there was a report the Flyers, uh, oh, you know, yeah, were yeah. looking to draft Russian players. That's been solely refuted by the team. Um, the Flyers I mean, were not looking. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's been refuted by the team that the Flyers, I mean, are open to drafting Russian players. Which, I mean, I thought when I first heard that report that that, I mean, was kind of nonsense nonetheless because they just signed. What I are they? Well. What are you fucking nuts? Look at this. Look at the Stanley <laughs> Cup Finals. Look at both goalies in the final. Or I'm sorry, yeah. not the finals. In the top four here, look at both goalies in the Eastern Conference right now, which are oh. the best two goalies in the league, the current one and the future one, and they're both Russian. So, like, let's let's relax here with that stuff. Like, uh, leave that yeah. stuff for the nonsense in the media. It, if it's an NHL team with things like that, all, you're insane. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. I think Tampa Bay wins more. Uh, yeah. I think that's what he's going to rebound. One Russian over the other. Well, they haven't lost, what, back-to-back -back playoff games in years, right? So, yeah. Is that right? Yeah, they have a, they just, they're 16 and 0, uh, or I think now 17 and 0 after that one game they lost to the Leafs. 17 and 0 when they lose a game in their next game. So when they lose a game in the playoffs, they're 17 and 0 the next game. Going wow. since like 2018, I think. So Great. yeah, it's crazy wow. stuff. That's resilience. <laughs> resilience. Um, <laughs> There's our answer. Well, I, honestly, like the Tampa Bay Lightning. It, I'm if, sure that's that's every other team's answer in the whole league, Jamie. Do you, do you guys anticipate that the Flyers make any moves at the draft? Um, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. So too. I, I could see it. I could see. I I, I either I to mean, move up, move down, or trade I, a player. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. Any to, of it. I don't know to move up. I mean, I could see anything as well. Everything really has to be on the table. Like if you're Chuck Fletcher, where the state of of this organization, you should be listening to every offer. Nothing should be out of the realm of possibility. You know, be open to any scenario, any situation. Did, did you guys you gotta, see like Morgan Frost traded for a first round pick, like a late no, first round no. pick? I don't no. think I'm like that, but if you could, let's say hypothetically the Flyers could trade Morgan Frost and somebody else and get, you know, a uh, bona fide, you know, so player number two, trade number two center or, or a, you know, a high end type of center, I think that's something they'd have to look into just based on their center depth and the fact that they need a high end scorer. Also, I mean, you got to look into the Ryan Ellis situation, right? We're going to know more about his treatment plan, how it's taking effect around the draft. Well, you know, I think that's a key thing. Like if he's hurt, um, and I've seen Bill Meltzer kind of reference this on Twitter, like if Ellis is, is hurt and the treatment isn't really going according to plan, they're going to need to try to find a oh, replacement. So that'll, happen at the that'll probably start to unfold at the draft, I would imagine. So, yeah, and we, we called that yeah, out, and that's, that's why Risto got a contract. So, yeah. Sorry, Jamie. I think that would happen before the draft because if if you if you listen to Chuck Fletcher's presser, he was trying to be like the nineteen twenty team. Do yeah. you remember who they? Do you remember who they traded for in nineteen twenty? They yeah, were trading good. their best. Yeah, exactly. They traded Gudis, you know, for for Matt Niskanen. So they're going to trade a an NHL ready player, whomever it is from the Flyers, to obtain that number one defenseman. So if that means, hey. I'm gonna part with Travis Konechny. I think they would part well, with Travis. I have, I have, I have one for you that I that I thought of. Okay. Uh, that yeah. I think potentially the Flyers could trade for Jake Muzzin. I could oh, see yeah. something like that. Uh, he's the type of player we need. Tampa or Tampa, Toronto is in kind of cap trouble. They might want to keep some players. They might want to lose some players. Jake Muzzin was a big part of their team, but also. Maybe they want to reallocate that money to get somebody maybe even better. Maybe they want to get a goaltender, which they might need, you know. Um, and I just thought maybe there's an option there, like a Jake Muzzin for a cheap defensive option, and we just eat the cap, right? Because then we have Ryan Ellis on LTIR for the next six yeah, years. Yeah, and that's in that situation, I mean, that would make sense. I mean, Muzzin, I don't think is a bona fide number one guy, but it's gonna be hard. It's gonna be hard, uh, or I don't think I don't think they're going to trade for a bona fide number one guy. No, yeah, that's what I mean. It's going to be hard to get get to that level to trade for, especially especially if other teams know, know that Ellis, you know, is 
out, obviously you're dealing from a position of weakness. So it's going to be harder to make that trade as a team. That's just how it is in negotiation. I just think that's, I think that's the type of play that they're going to go for. I think if, if Ellis can't make it back, it's going to be along the same like level but of Muzzin, who's like a good, a good number three guy that can step up and play bigger minutes, I think. But it'll if, also if, be a turn. It'll be one. You want to catch a team in, in a cap position, right? Exactly. Where you can, yeah. where you can just like the Niskan and trade that Jamie was talking about, the Niskan for good, right? The value there, we we won the value there because we were able to eat that cap. So that's exactly. why I was thinking about the same situation with somebody like Muzzin. And really, I, in, in or, my opinion, yeah, unless the team surprises, you could take you could take advantage of the the uh, Calgary Flames be, there, absolutely. And, and, and I and I say that not only for a defenseman, but what about Sean Monahan? Yeah. Like, you, well, if able, dude, if you're able to I get Muzzin. Eight million dollar cap hit though for a guy you're not sure can even play in your top six. One more year, so it depends what you. It depends what. Uh, and you could do JVR do. for Monahan straight up. Yeah, maybe. There's some interesting stuff. I mean, there's going to be. That's like the most I would do. This is the thing that I mean. We gotta we gotta look into right. That's is a horrible there's, idea, actually. there's always players. There's always players that are available in the off season that I mean we're unaware of right now. So I'm sure there's going to be. Players like there's every offseason that you're not aware of who's available, who's not, that might be mm-hmm. traded. So the Flyers need to keep their ears open and try to take advantage of those types of trades if possible, right? Yeah, I got no. JVR going to I got JVR going to Arizona. Yeah, I, I, I could see that. Pretty high on uh, Nick Schmaltz. Maybe they'd be able to uh, pry. Oh, yeah, that I think. Uh, you know what, Jamie? I don't think that that'll happen. But fuck, do I love that idea? That would be yeah. great. Yeah, that's exactly what the Flyers need right now. Yeah, is yeah, a guy yeah, that yeah, age? I mean, of course, J- it wouldn't be JVR straight up for Nick. It would. Smoltz, it would have to be Frost, like Frost, JVR, and probably a, a pick. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it would definitely jump start, and that's why. That's why I always go back because one thing Chuck Fletcher actually does well is he gives you a blueprint for the off season, and he sort of did, but he was sort of unclear about it this year because I think he's unclear. Of, of uh, there could be many scenarios. I think he's got written, you know, down on like, okay, this is my this is my guy right here. But if this doesn't go through, here's Plan B. Here's Plan C. I think he goes all the way down to Plan J, and uh, you know, and that 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 that's a good thing uh, for the, for him to do. But like, it, it when he said that, so are you going to move? you know, some, some youth to obtain, you know, better talent. And he said, well, it's going to be, it's going to be a two folds, uh, two parts. He said, yes and no. Um, yes, they could be used, you know, to obtain, but they would like younger talent coming back. So, you know, as well. So it's a give and take situation. And I think that's one of those give and take situations. You're going to take JBR. So, okay, I'll give you, you know, Morgan Frost or, or um, or another you know high end you know prospect in return you know for you know Nick Schmoltz, but another trade I see the Flyers making at the draft. I think the Flyers are going to move into the second round. I, I think I that, that yeah, that to me well, it would take like, it would be somewhat costly. Like, what would they move to get in the second round? Well, so when Fletcher moved up to grab Brink, you remember that? Yeah, uh, they traded two picks. What was it? Is the I don't know, but they could trade what both their thirds. Yeah, they have two thirds, right? So and they could trade both crap. of those to get into the second. That yeah, would especially if they enough. they have a guy they're targeting, or let's yeah. say there's somebody and just go for a first and a second. You know, yeah. go big, I, go home. I think what's going to happen is like like Vasily mentioned, where some of you know, actually this would be the best draft to do it to move into the second round because, like Vasily mentioned, there are well, some teams that he, are. Downplaying to the Russians, the Russians, yeah, yeah. So if there's some Russians that fall into the second round, and we're sitting here, and Fletcher's like, "All right, shit, here's my guy." Excuse me, here's my guy. I'm gonna move in. That's it. That that's it. I'm jumping the gun. I'm gonna grab him. That's it. I'm gonna move up and yeah, because you can get a first round talent. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean they they can really do the high high end Russian and. I don't know why the Flyers were brought into that mix when they just signed Ivan Fedotov. Yeah, it like, doesn't make a lot of sense. Make sense to me. Like, uh-huh. even without talking to any source within the organization, right away that didn't make sense to me why the Flyers were brought in. It was a head scratcher, and I was like, hold up. Chuck Fletcher 
just signed Ivan Fedotov. If if they were so against the Russians, he wouldn't have signed Ivan Fedotov, whom the Flyers have in, had indefinite rights to. Well, so I'm sorry to try. I, I'm kind of obsessed with this Sean Monahan thing here for a second because I didn't realize he had one year left on his contract. Yeah, he does. So this is the type of move. Now I'm looking at it. I'm like, okay, the cap hit 6.375 mil a year, right? Yeah. They're going to be desperate to get rid of that money because quite frankly, I mean, he used to be a very good center, but this year he didn't have a good season. On he a very had an injury team. though. He had, a, he had, a, he had an that, injury with the that's head. What so who say. knows if he can bounce back? He, he has injury problems. The Flyers, in my opinion, have an opportunity next year again, just like this one, to not be that competitive. This is the type of move where you can get him for almost nothing because of the remember? cap hit. But you but, can yeah. get him for nothing, and if he turns around, you literally get the problem that you need, and you might not be a good team because of you made that move. He's but can you eat it for the year? What? Yeah. He's an ideal candidate, Yurif. You know why? Think back to it. Just what, what you mentioned. He's 27. Do he you remember He's our Nolan Patrick had a down year in 2018-19, and some Cap fans were just like, let's get rid of this guy. He's done. Who, who was it? Who? Who? Matt Niskanen. You remember that? Oh, like, yeah, yeah. He, didn't, that, he didn't have a very good year in 2018. Yes. The Flyers banked on him having a good year with them, and he did. And Injuries. the Flyers got rid of their best defenseman at the time. He won the, Didn't Gudis win the Barry Ashby Trophy? Yeah, I did. Yeah. So they got argued. They got I rid think of it's their kind of a joke. But... Best defenseman for a, a Matt Niskan, for a project, a, what you would presume a project, right? Uh, you know, because Matt Niskanen didn't have the best year in 2018-19. Sean Monahan checks that box of the 2019-20 uh, reference that Chuck Fletcher, you know, referenced at his exit interviews. And there, there was someone else that I thought of on the uh, defensive side of the puck, but I'm going to have to do more research on it. I, I didn't get the chance. To well, I, I just think, I think the Sean Monaghan thing is very interesting because that's the type of risk that a good yeah. team can't take. Right. Yeah. But a bad team can. And because the only reason I would do it, I mean, he's 27 years old and you know, this it's been two seasons of injuries so far. So you are yeah. taking a risk there, but I mean, the guy's a former 60 to 80 point player in the NHL. Exactly. And it's technically, I mean, it's low risk because it's one year. Right. And ar- arguably if you, JVR, the, yeah, you if can swap, could, <laughs> if you could take out the cap hit, cause I think that's what um, Calgary's mindset's going to be. They're going to want to move that full hit out so they can, you know, that's allocate that money, allocate that money to Mangiapani or Gaudreau, whichever guy they end up going with. I'm and sure they also, would also to do Kachuk, right? So like if you if you're the Flyers, you could somehow eat that whole cap hit. I mean, they might give you, you know, a they also could let, prospect or something along those lines. They're gonna have to they can let Mondrapani right? walk, take JVR and be like, Well, we can't keep Mondrapani, but we'll keep JVR in a one year deal. And we'll <laughs> trade you for Monahan and that way we can sign Goudreau. I wish. Free up. I mean, it's not that crazy because, like, I no. don't know. Are they going to definitely keep Manjapani? I'm not 100. percent He had a breakout. He had a breakout year. So yeah, we'll but see. more in the first half of the season, the second half of the season, yeah. they're better players still. Goudreau. I like if I'm a GM, I think there's some consideration. I'm kind of like, well, Manjapani might be a little easier to replace. Yeah. Than Johnny Goudreau. Maybe I'm wrong though. I'm not that close to the team, so. And then the real thing too is like, let's say you did do that Monahan trade, you pulled the trigger on it, and the team's bad again. Like, let's say the Flyers are bad, but Monahan. Then you take back. for Bedard. That too, but but then that's a free. That's almost a free asset for you to trade at the deadline too. That, right? That's kind of what I'm saying. I was like, yeah, first, first it, yeah. it, 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 here's like, there's a great quote by Ian Rand, uh, and I love this quote, and I think it's something I think the fan base can probably relate to because they feel this way but it's the the quote is you can ignore reality but you cannot ignore the consequences of ignoring reality i like right that. so and if you look at the reality of the situation the flyers are not a playoff they might be a stanley cup contender but it's it's a very limited op- chance uh, from what we've seen so far maybe they could surprise you but i think the flyers need to enter next season with that be like I'm not going to go out and invest a bunch of shit into the team they're going to be next year. I'm going to invest in the team they can be the following year, right? And if they don't turn out, the tanking year is the best year 
to tank yeah. because even if you don't hit on Bedard, you have Michikov right yeah. afterwards. And number two is potentially equally as good. It's like next year is a year to be bad. And you can take chances like Monaghan or, and then, or keeping JVR and not yeah. losing assets. And if it works out, it works out. And just kind of letting it play off as it should. It's not good from a standpoint of fans won't be happy with that, but maybe it's another thing you have to do before you really clean up the lineup. And then the following year, all of a sudden, you know, maybe you do get lucky with Bedard or Michikov, or at least get an amazing player in this awesome draft. You you clear out your cap issues. Maybe a guy like Monahan because you traded for him turns out maybe not, but it doesn't matter. You're just kind of away from that that headache. Having said that there will be new problems that form in a year from now. So we do have to take that in consideration. Um, the good thing is, is that the Flyers can eat part of JVR's salary as well. Yeah. And Bedard, man, man, man. Connor Bedard, Bedard get, getting Connor Bedard would change this franchise uh, overnight. Oh, yeah. Dude, dude, listen, man, and not man, like the Oilers. People streaking in the streets again. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He's insane uh, talent. It would be like, it would be like the Flyers getting Eric Lindros again, or, or kind of like when the Maple Leafs got, uh, Austin, Matthews. Matthews, essentially on, on yeah. those levels. I mean, just his talent level is insane. Uh, I've a guy who could be the, the best player for your organization. Yeah, ever. I've gone, I've gone to watch some of his games and just like his speed on the ice is like McDavid level. It, he can it, carve it, through players, man. It, dude, he looks. Imagine even we knew Giroux was going to be what he was when he got drafted. That yeah. this is kind of what I was trying to talk about earlier with the draft. It's like imagine something falls. The, like we weren't supposed to get Sean Couturier the year we got him, right? When we traded that pick, right. nobody thought Sean Couturier would be available. He was, he was potentially a top pick in the draft. He was the Shane Wright of he that was the draft. Consensus, yeah. Well, yeah, only he dropped because he had mono. Even though, yeah. like, I see a lot of Couturier and Shane Wright probably, um, and and you know, in the the way it's played, and <clears throat> like you get a guy like a big name that just somehow, even the guy like Slavkovsky, if he falls to five for some weird reason, you know, it just, it's, it changes the, the cell of the team, you know, yeah. it, it, this is even a franchise changing guy. This is just a potentially an all-star guy, yeah. you know, but that alone is enough to shift it. I just think if you get enough of these good moves and like Fedotov is a good, is a good player and, you know, Milan Andre is still out there and you have a bunch of young guys and what a fucking Fair be again, only one or two of these guys really need to make a jump, not all of them. It's like you yeah. just have to have a few things go our way to get out of this. And I do think getting getting a player like Bedard changes everything overnight. We've seen that. It would it would like imagine adding Bedard to the team you see in front of you. It, overnight the Flyers would go from forget about this team to this is a dark horse for a Stanley Cup in the next two years. And it's not even a joke. They'll literally list everybody the Flyers have and be like, oh my God, Bedard with with TK, with Couturier. Like a one two punch of Bedard and Couturier. Couturier. Like, yeah, it would be crazy. <laughs> I, it would be, it would be wild to have one of the best defensive oh, centers yeah. and one of the best offensive centers in the NHL on the same team. It's, it's yeah. Patrice Bergeron oh. and, and Sidney Crosby together for oh, a yeah. team. <laughs> it, it's be crazy funny. because. Kind of had that Drew. There's put butts in the seats, that's for sure. Yeah, sell sell a lot of tickets. It's crazy to me because there's so many, like just the way that we're, we're kind of dissecting things and going into things. There's so many things the Flyers could do this season, but we're still kind of not sure on what we they're going to do at. And I I just think that like I'm not a hundred percent sure on where Chuck Fletcher's going, and in a way that kind of worries me. So I'm kind of interested to see some of these, you know first big moves get taken. Like I'm interested to see what happens at the draft because it's going to give us a way better idea of where the team's going, what kind of direction they're going in versus, you know, are they going to really be committed to uh, trying to get this thing turned around for next season? Or as we've kind of alluded to, it'd probably be better for them to take a step back and really focus on the 2020, um, you know, three twenty four season as a season where they try to really enter back into like Stanley cup and well, playoff contention. Uh, it's just interesting to see how well, they're going to kind of take shape here. Yeah, and I think we'll know what they do by who they draft or by who yeah. they hire if they hire yeah. a coach soon. If they hire Torts, they're going for the playoffs. If they hire yeah. Trots, they're going for the playoffs. If they hire Jim Montgomery, they might take it a little slower. Yeah, you know? exactly. But but I'll say this, and this has come from Jordan Hall's podcast. I'm sure other people have heard this, but I didn't realize this about uh, Torts. But I, I think 
Columbus missed the playoffs for 13 straight years, and then Torch showed up and they made the playoffs for four years in a row. Just shows the effect he can have. I think it's just the way he, you know, structures his team, and then also the way he, you know, commands an identity of his teams, and that's something I, the Flyers are lacking. Under Tortorella, they'll have an identity, that's for sure. I, yeah. My and I've said this in the beginning. I don't think he's a bad coach at all. My worry is that he'll be a sideshow here. That people he are like, oh, uh, Travis Konechny made a really nice move. Do you have a problem with that, John Tortorella? And he's going to be like, we won the hockey game. And then there's going to be an article. John Tortorella doesn't care about cool stuff. It's, like, I just don't want that. Like, that sounds so annoying to me. Where yeah. Chats, he doesn't care about the guy. locker room. He only cares about winning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in, I mean, in, in a sense, Tortorella would be good for the players because I think that there's a lot of media pressure on the attention market of like this. Yeah. Yeah. Look at the like pressure on the players. Cam Atkinson spoke very highly of John Tortorella at the exit interview. So, yeah. yeah. But look, it, realistically, is there anything that we have talked about today where you guys are going to be like, you know, like what the fuck? I guess if the Flyers go completely off the board in the draft, or yeah. they hire a guy that everybody's like, what? I, I guess somebody I don't want, like David Quinn's names come up. Yeah, I, I wouldn't be interested. Like, there's certain guys I'm like, like I get interviewing them, but like. But based on we the candidates that are, yeah, based on the candidates that are available, it wouldn't make sense. It'd almost be like, uh, you know, hiring a Dave Haxall instead of like, like you know, who was available so, that off season, right? So, so re- realistic best case scenario, the things the that have, yeah, they they um, sign Trots or no, they sign Torts, right? And they draft. I think we said Juracek, Nemich, uh, Kamel, Savoy. Cooley. I guess Cooley or Slavkovsky, I guess we could throw in there. Yeah. But I, odds are it's probably the first Jamie four Monahan. that I mentioned. What what's that, Jamie? Monahan, trade for trade for oh, Monahan. Yeah, yeah. yeah, trade for Monahan. <laughs> I mean, best best case scenario for the flyer, just to be because like I have no idea I mean what route they're gonna go because there's really nothing for us to to, the to tell. Yeah, it's really hard to tell based on you know what's happened so far on, on their kind of the route they're going as an organization. Are they going to go this aggressive retool? Are they going to take it slower? Is it going to be a combination? Uh, hard to know. Best case scenario is get a coach that brings some stability, brings an identity, somebody that ideally you're not going to fire in two years, um, which has been a theme. You know that's been happening with the organization lately. It's been a coaching carousel, right? What 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 do you say, Jamie's? Five or six coaches in the last decade. So this I mean, will be the greatest. higher in six seasons. Oh, hey, six seasons. Okay, guys, I, worse. I do want to point this out because I feel like it's important. I, I forgot sure. that the playoffs started as we were started recording, and the Avalanche are up on the Oilers three nothing right Damn. now. Damn, okay. which is and, but, not that surprising. But the Oilers could score at will at any time, just because <laughs> you know that's the thing. Uh, who was throwing three nothing last round? I, I would not be shocked if Colorado sweeps. They were down in, in, in yeah. a high scoring bout, like eight, like four, three, six, eight, but I outscores think, them every night. They were down four, nothing or something to Calgary. And they came back and made it like it was, I think it was like nine to seven at the end of it. Yeah. Like it was I, the first game of the series. So I could see every game being high scoring, even this one uh, where yeah. they're up three, nothing, but I literally could see avalanche sweeping. And I don't yeah. think it's because they're that much better. I just think the way they both play, it's like the Avs are a better version of what the Oilers are. Yeah, pretty much. They have a better version of what the Oilers have and everything. And, except ha- and, have a, and a better goalie. And though, so. though uh, Kemper's injured, actually, and it's Fran, Fran Kuz in that right Friends, now. So. Yeah, it doesn't seem to be mattering. He's got a... No, apparently <laughs> not. But, yeah. No, but anyway, back, back to like ideal um, kind of you know, off season, really, like I said, just starts with the coach, somebody that can, you know, shape an identity around the team. And then from that point, just bringing in high end talent. It's the thing that the team and, you know, we've all been going back to no matter who they draft, no matter who they sign, no matter who they trade for, it has to be players that can make an impact and help the team, you know, produce office, produce goals, because that was their main issue. Aside, I mean, obviously defending was not, you know, great this season, things like that. But it just the team wasn't able to really produce or cons- consistently sustain any sort of offense puck possession game at all. They were like, look at when you look at them this season. Did they have any sort of puck possession? No, in their no. Game they, have no 
They have no identity. They had, they had no style. Yeah. They had no consistency of play. You know, it's evident that this is a team that's gone through changes of leadership. It's evident that it's a team that's not united, that there's no culture that is sustained through all of the changes and through everything that we've done to try to gr- desperately try to, you know, spark the team in another way. It's probably dug the the hole a little bit deeper. Having said that, I, I tr- this might sound ignorant to people. I truly believe that everything can change overnight still. I've seen it, it happen yeah. many times in sports. I'm not saying it will. I haven't no. seen anything to, to say that it will right now, but it could. And that's why well, I say just temper expectations, but you know, go into next season. Don't go nuts. Make, yeah. make, make the right moves. Don't be desperate to get to the playoffs. Be desperate to, to turn the long-term. tide. What? I just want to see a coach here long-term. I'm tired of going through coaches. I'm saying. Well, I'm- Tortorella would last here long-term, even if he would be a side. There, he's like not getting your, fired quickly. I, I, like, I like all three that are mentioned. You know, none, so I have none of them would get fired you quickly. Know, you know, and and, and the, to me, this is a long term hire. This isn't a short term hire. It's got to be. Yeah. So, look, can, can I ask you guys something? Sure. Do you guys think that a guy like because this doesn't seem to be brought up for Barry Trotz, but it seems to be brought up for Tortorella, probably because Tortorella was recently, I guess, hasn't worked for a year, and Trotz was only recently fired. But if you're a coach and you've already won a cup. And you've been on good teams. Like when Trotz went to the Islanders, they weren't like the team to be. Um, no. Far from it. They were a project. Like, yeah. Don't you don't you think that at that these coaches would prefer that as a challenge? Be like, I've already won a cup. Like, like, like what I like to do is to take a problem and fix it. And this is a problem. This is a serious challenge that comes with a high fucking salary that you I mean, will get paid. Working that's, for a good way, that's a good way to look at things, I would say. That, and I think that's it's something how I that, see it. yeah, it's it's something that nobody's the really brought up. Franchise that well, if you turn around, it's one of the most profitable franchises. It's you're you're helping the NHL by doing this because the much. Flyers not making <laughs> as much money hurts all of the players in the league. It's like yeah, the Rangers not making money, wise, exactly. or, or the Rangers. It's like it's not good for the NHL for the Flyers to be a bad team. And like, I, I'm not saying that that's why the coach would do it, but I'm saying. Like it, it is this historic franchise with a humongous amount of money and an opportunity to be like, hey, we we need to turn this around. We're looking for help. We're looking for a coach to walk in here and make a big impact. And I keep hearing that like Barry Trout's going to take over uh, Fletcher. I don't really believe any of that stuff. I I really just believe like, look, if it works, they'll make a relationship like. Elaine Vigno could have also been the type of guy who takes over. He didn't take over. He was got he got fired in the end. We we just need to find the coach that works. And I, I think if it's Trotz, if it's Montgomery, whatever, I just think it can work with any of these guys potentially. But I don't see why Barry Trotz is a like like the other options that are out there. Like I get that to other people who follow this team, they look like they're so much better. Every team uh, that needs a coach is a mess in some kind of way. Like well, you're, not, you're not walking into a rosy situation with almost any of these teams. Well, uh, team like Vegas. So, so last season, the, the, the last season, this is based off 2020, 21 numbers. Uh, the Flyers made one hundred and sixteen million dollars profited, okay. while the Winnipeg Jets profited sixty eight point five million. So yeah, that's like, the Flyers being bottom of the league. Exactly. Right. <laughs> no, I get that. I understand that. I'm just saying Winnipeg also has money as well to where that they could throw X amount of dollars at say Not, Barry Trotz or John. Torrell. Yeah. But the, the flyers can afford to pay Elaine Vino $5 million a year to not coach and then pay. No, I, I, I seven it. million. I, no, I you know, understand that it's as well. Comcast money. No what, cap. I, what I'm saying is, is that Winnipeg is also a project a bit when, when you have like all that talent, they all are, the they all are. Yeah. So, like, I mean, when you want Connor on your team, if you're a coach, like when you want somebody right, like Kyle Connor, like right, come on, right, right, yeah, exactly. Connor Hellebuck. And then, so, like Barry Trotz, I mean, it's his hometown. This is a tough decision for Barry because but, but, there is no doubt in my mind that he's really weighing the Flyers right now. 
Oh, I can that, see it for sure. That, that's my whole point is that I, I think we are one of the top considerations out there for coaching yeah. option in general. There's no doubt. Well, There's you know no what? The, the Flyers are a storied franchise. I mean, almost essentially in the original six. Like, it means something to be a part of the Flyers organization, coach the Flyers. There's been, you know, tons of coaches that have come through, you know, the doors of, of yeah. the organization and, and have been great coaches, um, you know, through, throughout their NHL career. So I don't think that you know, just based on where the team is at right now, that trots would be like totally out of, you know, totally out of consideration at all. Because like you said, each team that he ultimately would go to, except for, you know, a few, few teams that, you know, were in the playoffs that might consider making a change or like a Vegas, they're all going to have their flaws and they're all going to have, oh, you know, yeah. issues yeah. with them. Right. So either yeah. way, I think it's really going to come down to uh, at least for the coaching and, and for trots, probably, I mean, money is going to be a significant factor and then obviously, you know, it could be a family situation based on, you know, the, the Winnipeg, or there could be other factors that we're not really aware of, which is probably going to end up being the deciding factor, something that we're well, not really privy but, to. But right? that's what I was saying. If we're, if we're taking location into effect, I mean, he's been coaching in New York. Yeah, and, exactly. And uh, locally in this area, in that area. It's literally 70 miles from here, um, yeah. 70, 100 miles from here. So it's like, it's not out of the realm possibility. I'm just yeah. saying it's not, I don't know if we're the top choice, but I, I don't know why we wouldn't be, especially because we, we will pay more than every other team. We'll, we'll yeah. at the very least force other teams to raise their price. Yeah, And there's, to there's, match talented what we're players, gonna yeah. there's talented players on the team that would fit into a system pretty well. Like, I mean, a Sean Couturier, Sean and Couturier is, is they fit and, a and, system, and, so. and God forbid I say this, Yvonne Provov is absolutely the type of defenseman that would excel under Barry Trotz. Same with yeah. Coots. Cam Atkinson. Uh, so same with uh, Torts. I think Torts would also well, get any of those three aforementioned coaches. Uh, I think uh, you know Coots and Provy. Who who's the, who is the least exciting of those three for you guys? For the coaches? Yeah. Who would you rather have the least? Um. Between those three. But what is it? Montgomery, Trotz, Tortorella. Yeah. Um. Honestly. I would probably say Tortorella, but it's not by much. I mean, yeah. it's between ta- tra- honestly, it's between Trotz and Tortorella for me. I, I'm more high on Montgomery than both of them. I'm higher on Montgomery than both of them. But that's just, I mean, I, I've done a lot of research into his systems and stuff, so that's more of why. Obviously, Trotz has a great system as well. Tortorella has a great system. I just think the Flyers and the way that they're kind of fostering a lot of young players, and they have a lot of the young players, it'd be better to go with like a more puck possession, fast style of play that Montgomery would kind of um, implement versus like defense first, like Tortorella and Trotz. I think that could stunt growth for some of the younger guys, but yeah, that's all, that's all hearsay. I mean, who knows if Montgomery's going to run the same system he ran in Dallas here, he could do something totally different based on the players that he's been afforded with, right? That coaches can change their systems all the time. Boy, well, that's we- what I'm just going to say. It depends on who, you know, like when we compare, you know, the Dallas stars team, you know, yeah. to the Flyers team, you might not run the same system. Exactly. Mm-hmm. You might not be able to because of the different caliber of players or the different, you know, each player is different. So, exactly. but yeah, I think it's I think it's quite unique. But the good thing is, is that he has a whole training camp, you know, and plus to figure this out. So that that's good, um, exactly. as opposed to firing a coach mid season and then hiring. I know, you know, that was thrown around. The only one, Bruce Boudreaux did an excellent job with Vancouver. I thought anyway, but uh, that would have been a good hire. Uh, yeah, if, I mean, he, if he was uh, available. Yeah, there aren't many coaches that could do that though to come in like mid. That's what dude he does that every time. That's what I was yeah. saying when I in the earlier in the year where I was like, him and Ken Hitchcock are like very good for that. You know, what me mean? and you, Ken, you were calling for him when when the Flyers fired the coach. Like, get on Boudreaux. I was calling for Gallant. Yeah, that too. When he that was, was fired, I was that like was last season. Yeah. I, dude, that's why, like, in my heart, I was like, I feel comfortable with all three of these options. So that actually makes me feel pretty good. Like, yeah. I'm not really worried about the coach right now because any of those three, I see a positive outcome from that. And I think that's a I really agree. good place for us to be in. It's like having a UFA market where there are too many good, good players. Yeah. And that's really nice right now because there's a lot and of even, good coaches available. Even beyond, like, those three, there's still some other good options that are That's what that I'm saying. It's not a too, terrible... So. Situation, yeah. not a Dave unless, Haxtell, Brady, unless, uh, yeah, yeah, unless they unless they go completely off the Paul Maurice as well. Unless they go completely yeah. off the board, oh, Paul Maurice, yeah, Dude, unless they go completely off the board. Can't like I think, it, I think they'll get a good coaching candidate. Deneen, I think, was thrown out there. Kevin Deneen, yeah. Um, 
I think they're looking for a structure, you know, kind of. They want someone to build a culture, build an identity, which the team doesn't yeah. have. So. so, I don't know. That's, that the main, that's the main theme, I think. To end it off, we have what we have a, a you know, one resiliency final starts with the coach. Yeah, resiliency starts with the coach and building an identity. And what should be the plan going forward? I mean, hire a coach, let, build an identity. Let, see what let's at, let's ask this actually before we end on this. Who are okay. the players that you can identify currently signed with the team or RFAs um, that you would say add, add to the resiliency of the team that could be part of like a playoff fit? And like, so I'll, I'll, I'll go through them and we can, we can say yes or no. How about that? Okay, sure. Oh, so Kevin Hayes. Yes. Yes. Jamie? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, JVR? Uh, no. No. I'm gonna say no on that. Amy, I'm iffy on. Uh, I'd say no. No, ten. Okay, I think iffy's fair though. Yeah. Uh, Cam Atkinson. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Travis Konechny. Yes. 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 Agreed. Joel Farabee. Yes. 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 Scott Lawton. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Here's a tough one. Oscar Lindblom. Yes. I mean, you can't say you got to go with the resilience of him. I, I say yes. Okay. I say yes based off what he's dealt with. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Um, Bobby Brink. Well, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Do you want to say something else about Limbaum? I For some reason, I just think he's going to be moved. Uh, I, I could see. Yeah. I could totally see it happening. They have a lot of wingers. They have a lot of. They have a log jam at wings. So yeah, he's twenty five. Go. I could totally see it. He's an RFA next year. Um, Bobby Brink. Ah uh, no. TBD. Yeah. Not yet. Not yeah. yet. Yeah, he's too. He's too young. You got to see uh, a more. You got to see more of him first before you can classify. So that, as of right now, no. But yeah. maybe he's a maybe. Uh, no, Cates. Yes. Yes. I don't know. Uh, he's he's uncertain fair. right now. Fair. That's fair enough. I, if you go on the small sample size, I'll say yes. But like we said, we only really saw nine games, so we yeah. might be jumping the gun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Patrick yeah. Brown. I liked yeah. what I saw. Him. Huh? Patrick uh, Brown for, for Brown. Um, I I mean, I think he's a hard nosed player and could help you win in the playoffs. Like he could be a good fourth line center for for you in the playoffs win face off. So I'll, I'll say yeah. I say yes, but as a thirteenth forward. Fair enough. Yeah, I, I would want him. I mean, ideally, Lazinski ahead of him if it was, you know. Yeah, ideally, he's out of my lineup, but yeah, I would say yes, depending on injury. <laughs> yeah, know. exactly. 13th forward. Yes, yeah. Uh, Morgan Frost. Yeah. As of right now, no, in my mind. Okay. Jamie? I don't know. I, I, I'm iffy because I don't think we've. Actually, seen the actual yeah. it's TBD. It's definitely yeah. TBD. Yeah, we've like, seen, I mean, that's we've seen the improvement. I, like, I'm, I'm with him year. where I am with Bobby Brink. Is like Fair. I yeah. could see it, you know, but yeah, I got to see it first. That's all got to fall into place. In a full <laughs> season, yeah. I want to give him a full season in the uh, NHL first. Yeah, which I think he will get next year. So Zach McEwen. Yeah. Yes, but is he part of a cup? Solution? I I don't know about that. I honestly don't even know if they're gonna sign him back. Yeah, uh, I, I was gonna say I think he is that type of guy. I don't know if he's gonna be part of it here though. Yeah, exactly. Even though I thought he should though. be initially, but he's a yes for me. Okay. Yes, I mean I I I would not be upset if he's back. Hard nosed, like, hard nosed player gives us. We have a numbers problem. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, and then Owen Tippett. Yes. I'll say yeah, because just the boom, yes. the boom, the boom bust, and just the way uh, he played, you know, coming over from Florida, like he created the most scoring chances on the whole team um, over I, his time here. So like, I that's suspect him and Joel Farabee seem like the biggest breakout candidates for next year. Yeah, I could see that for sure. So on TBD on uh, Owen Tippett as well, because I don't think he's been given a fair shake in the yeah. NHL, like for for an entire. You know, season as well with him being up and down, up and yeah. down, and it's fair. stuff like that. But I will say this: uh, he looks very good in the orange and black. And uh, I am, you know, happy that they have, you know, Tippett. I think he fills void 
Um, so I, I thought he played very well with the Flyers. So I'm pretty excited for him moving forward for sure. Okay. Yeah, he has big boom bust potential like you yes. were saying earlier. Yeah, I like that. Uh, Ivan Provorov. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I think 100% for me. I know people won't agree yeah, with that. But I'm, I'm 100% as well. I'm 100% in on Ivan. That guy, that guy's... That guy is committed to the to like his game and just just mm-hmm. look at how he trains off the ice. Like, I completely agree. This he wants fr- he wants to. He you wants guys to win. have no idea how flabbergasted I was this year that I saw people attacking Provorov. Like I, was, I get, things have really hit that low here. Uh, uh, that's what we've gotten to. We've gotten to the point where we don't like anybody on the team anymore. Nobody. We don't like anybody. Even Carter Hart. We don't like we don't like them all. We we want a whole new team. I want everybody. I want all new. Fuck the craps. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, Rasmus Ristolainen. Yeah. Yeah. I actually, people are, I think, are really low on him. And I noticed people discrediting his season. He had a good season. He didn't have a bad season. Where he was highly effective this year on a team that wasn't very. You know, the thing with Ristolainen is, and and this is my thing, is like, if you've never um, played the game of hockey, a lot of the stuff that he brings is kind of hard to measure. Just like if you're playing with him, uh, and he's on the ice, you know, like you're, you're not going to be able to take liberties, uh, yeah. you know, how things like that were happening pre- in previous seasons. And also I think a big factor with wrist lining that is, is kind of under, under looked at or kind of under focused on is the fact that, I mean, we saw Sandheim struggle as soon as he got kind of acclimated to playing with wrist lining, his game was great. And yeah. Think- and then what happened when he was out? Wrist line he wasn't here. Sandheim wasn't playing the greatest. So like it just shows that having two guys that can play together like that in conjunction are on the same page, it really helps benefit both of their games. So yeah. I think and that's, that's what, an underrated that, thing to that, look at. And that. that's why I go back to the draft. And that's why if you're Chuck Fletcher and you don't have a top pairing defender anymore in uh um in Ellis, yeah, like, and you you know, yeah. you see York out there who's a left side D, you know. And then you look at your D and you're like, well, Nemec or Juracek is out there. And you're like, that guy slots in very nicely next to Provorov, right? Either one of them. Yeah. So like, you know, just, just something to consider. Um, all right. So, uh, yeah, we went through Rasmus versus the line in Travis Sanheim. Yes. yes. Yeah. I think so too. I think those are the, the backbone of the D right now. Exactly. Uh, all right. Cam York. Uh, yes, I would say so. Yeah, I, I think he's a hundred. I think he is the type of guy that you build Stanley Cup teams around for sure. Um, he has the potential; just has to get there, right? And dude, I, I wouldn't be shocked if he if he makes one uh, if he makes a defenseman um, like tradable within the next couple of years. Well, well, we might not trade anybody, but people might be screaming for that because York is past somebody, you know. Definitely possible. I like how he's coming back, you know, in June. Actually, he's probably already back in Gordon's now. Uh, yeah, he's, he's, tra- he's training in Philadelphia this summer. That always, I think, I mean, Frost is to too, well. right? Frost as well no. is sticking around. Oh, no, still- who, okay. who, who is I think maybe it's Farabee? Somebody's staying around. Well, Farabee's coming back in July, like he always oh, okay. does. Okay. But Ryan Ellis, Ryan Ellis is staying close because of train uh, treatments and stuff okay. like that. Fingers crossed for Ellis. Yeah, cross, it's yeah. a best cross, case scenario yeah. if he comes back. It's a humongous game changer for this team if that happens. Who? Ellis. Ellis. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Yep. If he if he is healthy <laughs> to play <laughs> next year, everything is changing. But if people yeah. can get upset at me. Everything is changing. The plans are changing. The way the expectations for next season. Not having that role filled is a completely different than having it filled it it completely tilts the edge whether this team is competitive or not um which is not good but that's where this team is right now um ronnie it's hard no it's too early to know i think he's i think he needs a potentially yeah Yeah, he needs ahl time too i'm I'm only going to go off the uh nhl roster guys yeah yeah Uh, i didn't get to these guys because they were on the injured reserve here but sean couturier yeah, 100%. no brainer. Ryan Ellis, they're both yeah. absolutely fit that mold. And again, it, this is what this team was missing. Plus Hayes, which pretty yeah. much all year you can say Hayes. Yeah. Um, that's an immense loss for this team. Uh, Carter Hart. Yes. Yeah. Based on just look at how he bounced back after like the worst season ever 100%. in his career, that just shows it and proves. He's going to be there. huge oh. when we uh, beat New York um, next year in the Eastern Conference Finals. Um, <laughs> 
<laughs> uh, there's the little there's the the big the positivity shining through I love it. it's coming back <laughs> uh i haven't watched them play in a while so maybe that's why uh, um uh and i'll just list them even though this is gonna be a really hard question to answer but uh ivan fedotov uh i mean sure. we have no idea hard to know yeah hard yeah. to know but I'll say, you know, there, there's a good chance that he's going to be a good backup uh, just based off his prior work in the KHL and how those KHL goalies have translated to the NHL, like with Shesterkin and Sorokin. There's a tr- track record there. They're all in the same age group. Yeah. I don't think that's a coincidence, right? There's something developmental wise they're doing in Russia that's uh, translating with the goalies. And then I, I guess just to throw it in here, we have uh, Isaac Ratcliffe, Tanner Lazinski, and Wade Allison, which are all three guys who... I mean, I would say... For Allison, yes, because he's coming back from so yeah. many injuries. Same with Lazinski battling back from injury. Um, Ratcliffe battling back from injury. But it's also hard to know with those guys at the NHL level. Just because Ratcliffe can make the much. team next year, dude. They, it's they possible. Ha- dude, Fletcher's got to make a move. We cannot continue. Too many to- prospects, especially winger Too many prospects. guys in the same role. Like, yeah. no bueno, brother. You got you to gotta start doing shit. And getting rid of Connor McLennan is not, is not the start of that. All right, let's wrap it up here, guys. We're at two hours, so we did a really Jesus. long one. Jamie, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, Vasily, I'll, I'll go to you first. What do you got coming out that you want to tell people about? Um, so there will be an article uh, out on Saturday uh, diving into Joaquin Kamala's draft profile. Uh, I'm going to be trying to do a couple more draft profile articles uh, uh, surrounding the players that should be available uh, where the Flyers select at number five. So keep on the lookout for that at flyersnittygritty.com. And all the rest of the great content everybody else, you know, puts their work into. Uh, thanks for reading, everybody. We appreciate it. Yeah, hell yeah, Jamie. What do you got going on? Uh, so we got some articles coming out with uh, Matthew Savoy. We had a nice interview with him. Uh, Yoshi Kemmel uh, should be getting some questions back from him. Uh, believe it or not, we did interview him as well. So uh, th- those are coming out. But you know, each day we just come out with something. I'll, I'll come out with something. You know, over this weekend, maybe not Saturday, maybe for Sunday of like exit interviews, something from exit interviews that uh, I still want to touch on some of the stuff from exit interviews. Like there's some stuff that I'm not happy with. Uh, like I hate to dive back into this, but um, Morgan Frost, for instance, the organization being uncertain on where he's going to play next season in terms of position, uh, I think, you know, it was a big problem for me. That was one of the biggest uh, problems that I had at exit interviews that he's uncertain. So just stuff like that. I'm going to come out with. Sweet. Perfect. Sounds pretty good, man. Um, Again, make sure to follow Jamie uh, on Twitter. If you're not already, Um, I don't know how you wouldn't, but that's at Jamie Baskow. Follow myself. Why Wallach, which I'm on that every social media. Try to keep it as simple and stupid as possible. Though looking back on it, having my name out there, not so fun. Uh, and then uh, Vasily Regina Rocco's is flyer it up, right? Yep. Yep. Cool. Got it right. Um, all right. Thank you everybody for listening. We really appreciate. It. Please like, subscribe, share. Go to the team store. Do the whole thing. Um, yeah, it's immensely, immensely uh, beneficial. Every time you guys like, comment. Um, again, I try to read all the comments. Try to at least like acknowledge all the comments. Um, and uh, yeah, it's been awesome. And uh, our, every time we have Steve Cornianos, our numbers jump. jump. Oh, yeah. So we're going to have him back on. Um, <laughs> he's awesome. It's okay, man. we're going to jump this week with Jamie on once everybody yeah. figures it out. Yeah, no no pressure, Jamie. Through the roof. <laughs> no pressure, Jamie. No pressure at all. Uh, no. Definitely not of Steve's caliber, so... I mean, do great work. You, though, you got a lot of followers online. You got a lot more follow. than we you do. You need to follow the silly and Yuri. They're yeah. good people. No, you're good people. Yeah, all right. Uh, thank you all. We love you very much. Um, again, thank you so much for listening. And remember to always stay gritty. <laughs>